Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Nine, in which the orphan makes his will The secretary, working in the dismal swamp betimes next morning, was informed that a youth waited in the hall who gave the name of Sloppy. The footman who communicated this intelligence made a decent pause before uttering the name, to express that it was forced on his reluctance by the youth in question, and that if the youth had had the good sense and good taste to inherit some other name, it would have spared the feelings of him the bearer. "'Mrs. Boffin will be very well pleased,' said the secretary in a perfectly composed way. "'Show him in.' Mr. Sloppy, being introduced, remained close to the door, revealing in various parts of his form many surprising, confounding, and incomprehensible buttons. "'I'm glad to see you,' said John Rokesmith, in a cheerful tone of welcome. "'I've been expecting you.' Sloppy explained that he had meant to come before, but that the orphan, of whom he made mention as our Johnny, had been ailing, and he had waited to report him well. "'Then he is well now?' said the secretary. "'No, he ain't,' said Sloppy. Mr. Sloppy, having shaken his head to a considerable extent, proceeded to remark that he thought Johnny must have took him from the minders. Being asked what he meant, he answered, "'Them that come out upon him, and particular his chest.' Being requested to explain himself, he stated that, "'There was some of em what you couldn't carve with a sixpence.' Pressed to fall back upon a nominative case, he opined, "'That they was bout as red as ever red could be. But as long as they strikes outwards, sir,' continued Sloppy, "'they ain't so much. It's their striking innards as to be kept off.' John Rokesmith hoped the child had had medical attendance. "'Oh, yes,' said Sloppy. He had been took to the doctor's shop once. "'And what did the doctor call it?' Rokesmith asked him. After some perplexed reflection, Sloppy answered, brightening, "'He called it something as was very long for spots.' Rokesmith suggested measles. "'No,' said Sloppy, with confidence, "'ever so much longer than them, sir.' Mr. Sloppy was elevated by this fact, and seemed to consider that it reflected credit on the poor little patient. "'Mrs. Boffin will be sorry to hear this,' said Rokesmith. "'Mrs. Higdon said so, sir, when she kept it from her, hoping as our Johnny would work round.' "'But I hope he will,' said Rokesmith, with a quick turn upon the messenger. "'I hope so,' answered Sloppy. It all depends on their striking innards. He then went on to say that whether Johnny had took em from the minders, or whether the minders had took em from Johnny, the minders had been sent home and had got em. Furthermore, that Mrs. Higdon's days and nights being devoted to our Johnny, who was never out of her lap, the whole of the mangling arrangements had devolved upon himself, and he had had rather a tight time. The ungainly piece of honesty beamed and blushed as he said it, quite enraptured with the remembrance of having been serviceable. "'Last night,' said Sloppy, "'when I was a-turning at the wheel pretty late, the mangle seemed to go like our Johnny's breathing. It began beautiful. Then, as it went out, it shook a little and got unsteady.' Then, as he took the turn to come home, it had a rattle like, and lumbered a bit, and it come smooth, and so it went on, till I scarce knowed which was Mangle, and which was our Johnny. Nor our Johnny, he scarce knowed either, for sometimes, when the Mangle lumbers, he says, Me choking, Granny. And Mrs. Higdon holds him up in her lap and says to me, Bide a bit, Sloppy. And we all stops together. 
and when our Johnny gets his breathing again, I turns again, and we all goes on together. Sloppy had gradually expanded with his description into a stare and a vacant grin. He now contracted, being silent, into a half-repressed gush of tears, and, under pretence of being heated, drew the under part of his sleeve across his eyes with a singularly awkward, laborious, and roundabout smear. "'This is unfortunate,' said Rokesmith. "'I must go and break it to Mrs. Boffin. Stay you here, Sloppy.' Sloppy stayed there, staring at the pattern of the paper on the wall, until the secretary and Mrs. Boffin came back together. And with Mrs. Boffin was a young lady, Miss Bella Wilfer by name, who was better worth staring at, it occurred to Sloppy, than the best of wall-papering. "'Ah, oh, my poor dear pretty little John Harmon!' exclaimed Mrs. Boffin. "'Yes, Mum,' said the sympathetic Sloppy. "'You don't think he is in a very, very bad way, do you?' asked the pleasant creature, with a wholesome cordiality. Put upon his good faith, and finding it in collision with his inclinations, Sloppy threw back his head, and uttered a mellifluous howl, rounded off with a sniff. "'So bad as that!' cried Mrs. Boffin. "'And Betty Egdon, not to tell me of it sooner!' "'I oh, think—' "'She might have been mistrustful, Mum,' answered Sloppy, hesitating. "'Of what, for heaven's sake?' "'I think she might have been mistrustful, Mum,' returned Sloppy, with submission, "'of standing in our Johnny's light. "'There's so much trouble in illness, and so much expense.' "'and she's seen such a lot of it being objected to.' "'But she never can have thought,' said Mrs. Boffin, "'that I would grudge the dear child anything.' "'No, ma'am, but she might have thought, as a bit like, "'of it standing in Johnny's light, "'and might have tried to bring him through it unbeknownst.' Sloppy knew his ground well to conceal herself in sickness like a lower animal, to creep out of sight and coil herself away and die, had become this woman's instinct. To catch up in her arms the sick child who was dear to her, and hide it as if it were a criminal, and keep off all ministration but such as her own ignorant tenderness and patience could supply, had become this woman's idea of maternal love, fidelity, and duty. The shameful accounts we read every week in the Christian year, my lords and gentlemen and honourable boards, the infamous records of small official inhumanity, do not pass by the people as they pass by us, and hence these irrational, blind, and obstinate prejudices, so astonishing to our magnificence, and having no more reason in them, God save the Queen, and confound their politics, no, than smoke has in coming from fire." "'It's not a right place for the poor child to stay in,' said Mrs. Boffin. "'Tell us, dear Mr. Rokesmith, what to do for the best.' He had already thought what to do, and the consultation was very short. He could pave the way, he said, in half an hour, and then they would go down to Brentford. "'Pray, uh, take me,' said Bella. Therefore a carriage was ordered of capacity to take them all and in the meantime Sloppy was regaled, feasting alone in the secretary's room, with a complete realisation of that fairy vision—meat, beer, vegetables, and pudding. In consequence of which his buttons became more importunate of public notice than before, with the exception of two or three about the region of the waistband, which modestly withdrew into a creasy retirement. Punctual to the time appeared the carriage, and the secretary. He sat on the box, and Mr. Sloppy graced the rumble. So to the three magpies as before, where Mrs. Boffin and Miss Bella were handed out, and whence they all went on foot to Mrs. Betty Higdon's. But on the way down they had stopped at a toy-shop, and had bought that noble charger, a description of whose points and trappings had on the last occasion conciliated the then worldly-minded orphan, and also a Noah's Ark, and also a yellow bird with an artificial voice in him, and also a military doll, so well dressed, 
that if he had only been of life-size, his brother officers in the guards might never have found him out. Bearing these gifts, they raised the latch of Betty Higdon's door, and saw her sitting in the dimmest and furthest corner, with poor Johnny in her lap. "'And how's my boy, Betty?' asked Mrs. Boffin, sitting down beside her. "'He's bad. He's bad.' said Betty. "'I begin to be afeard he'll not be yours any more than mine. All others belonging to him have gone to the power and the glory, and I have a mind that they're drawing him to them, leading him away.' "'No, no, no,' said Mrs. Boffin. "'I don't know why else. He clenches his little hand as if it had hold of a finger that I can't see. Look at it,' said Betty, opening the wrappers in which the flushed child lay, and showing his small right hand lying closed upon his breast. "'It's always so. It don't mind me.' "'Is he asleep?' "'No, I think not.' "'You're not asleep, my Johnny?' "'No,' said Johnny, with a quiet air of pity for himself, and without opening his eyes. "'Here's the lady, Johnny, and the horse.' Johnny could bear the lady with complete indifference, but not the horse. Opening his heavy eyes, he slowly broke into a smile, on beholding that splendid phenomenon, and wanted to take it in his arms. As it was much too big, it was put upon a chair where he could hold it by the mane and contemplate it, which he soon forgot to do. But Johnny murmuring something with his eyes closed, and Mrs. Boffin not knowing what, old Betty bent her ear to listen, and took pains to understand. Being asked by her to repeat what he had said, he did so two or three times, and then it came out that he must have seen more than they supposed when he looked up to see the horse, for the murmur was, "'Who is the boofer lady?' Now the boofer, or beautiful, lady was Bella, and whereas this notice from the poor baby would have touched her of itself, it was rendered more pathetic by the late melting of her heart to her poor little father, and their joke about the lovely woman. So Bella's behaviour was very tender and very natural when she kneeled on the brick floor to clasp the child, and when the child, with a child's admiration of what is young and pretty, fondled the boofer lady. "'Now, my good dear Betty,' said Mrs. Boffin, hoping that she saw her opportunity, and laying her hand persuasively on her arm, "'we have come to remove Johnny from his cottage to where he can be taken better care of." Instantly, and before another word could be spoken, the old woman started up with blazing eyes, and rushed at the door with the sick child. "'Stand away from me, every one of ye!' she cried out wildly. "'I see what you mean now. Let me come away, all of ye. I'll sooner kill the pretty and kill myself.' "'Stay, stay!' said Rokesmith, soothing her. "'You don't understand.' "'I understand too well. I know too much about it, sir. I've run from it too many a year. No, never for me, nor for the child, while there's water enough in England to cover us.' The terror, the shame, the passion of horror and repugnance, firing the worn face and perfectly maddening it, would have been a quite terrible sight, if embodied in one old fellow-creature alone. Yet it crops up, as our slang goes, my lords and gentlemen and honourable boards, in other fellow-creatures, rather frequently. "'It's been chasing me all my life, but it shall never take me, nor mine alive,' cried old Betty. "'I've done with ye. I'd have fastened door and window, and starved, afore I'd ever have let ye in, if I'd known what you came for.' But— Catching sight of Mrs. Boffin's wholesome face, she relented, and crouching down by the door and bending over her burden to hush it, said humbly, "'Maybe my fears has put me wrong. If they have so, tell me, and the good Lord forgive me.' 
I'm quick to take this fright, I know, and my head is summit light with wearying and watching. There, 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 returned Mrs. Boffin. Come, come, say no more of it, Betty. It was a mistake, a mistake. Any one of us might have made it in your place, and felt just as you do. The Lord bless ye, said the old woman, stretching out her hand. Now, see, Betty, pursued the sweet, compassionate soul, holding the hand kindly, what I really did mean, and what I should have begun by saying out, if I'd only been a little wiser and handier, we want to move, Johnny, to a place where there are none but children, a place set up on purpose for sick children, where the good doctors and nurses pass their lives with children, talk to none but children, touch none but children, comfort and cure none but children. "'Is there really such a place?' asked the old woman, with a gaze of wonder. "'Yes, Betty, on my word, and you shall see it. "'If my home was a better place for the dear boy, I'd take him to it. "'But indeed, indeed, it's not.' "'You shall take him,' returned Betty, fervently kissing the comforting hand. "'Where you will, my dearie. I'm not so hard, but that I believe your face and voice, and I will, as long as I can see and hear. This victory gained, Rokesmith made haste to profit by it, for he saw how woefully time had been lost. He dispatched Sloppy to bring the carriage to the door, caused the child to be carefully wrapped up, bade old Betty to get her bonnet on, collected the toys, enabling the little fellow to comprehend that his treasures were to be transported with him, and had all things prepared so easily that they were ready for the carriage as soon as it appeared, and in a minute afterwards were on their way. Sloppy they left behind, relieving his overcharged breast with a paroxysm of mangling. At the children's hospital the gallant steed, the Noah's Ark, Yellow Bird, and the officer in the guards were made as welcome as their child owner. But the doctor said aside to Rokesmith, This should have been days ago, too late. However, they were all carried up into a fresh, airy room, and there Johnny came to himself, out of a sleep or a swoon, or whatever it was, to find himself lying in a little quiet bed, with a little platform over his breast, on which were already arranged, to give him heart and urge him to cheer up, the Noah's Ark, the noble steed, and the yellow bird with the officer in the guards doing duty over the whole, quite as much to the satisfaction of his country as if he had been upon parade. And at the bed's head was a coloured picture, beautiful to see, representing, as it were, another Johnny, seated on the knee of some angel, surely who loved little children. And, marvellous fact, to lie and stare at, Johnny had become one of a little family, all in little quiet beds except two playing dominoes in little armchairs at a little table on the hearth. And on all the little beds were little platforms, whereon were to be seen dolls' houses, woolly dogs with mechanical barks in them, not very dissimilar from the artificial voice pervading the bowels of the yellow bird, tin armies, moorish tumblers, wooden tea-things, and the riches of the earth. As Johnny murmured something in his placid admiration, the ministering woman at his bed's head, asked him what he said. It seemed that he wanted to know whether all these were brothers and sisters of his. So they told him yes. It seemed then that he wanted to know whether God had brought them all together there. So they told him yes again. They made out then that he wanted to know whether they would all get out of pain. So they answered yes to that question likewise, and made him understand that the reply included himself. Johnny's powers of sustaining conversation were as yet so very imperfectly developed, even in a state of health, that in sickness they were little more than monosyllabic. But he had to be washed and tended, and remedies were applied, and though those offices were far, far more skilfully and lightly done than ever anything had been done for him in his little life, so rough and short, 
they would have hurt and tired him but for an amazing circumstance which laid hold of his attention. This was no less than the appearance on his own little platform, in pairs, of all creation, on its way into his own particular ark. The elephant leading, and the fly, with a diffident sense of his size, politely bringing up the rear. A very little brother lying in the next bed, with a broken leg, was so enchanted by this spectacle that his delight exalted its enthralling interest, and so came rest and sleep. "'I see you're not afraid to leave the dear child here, Betty,' whispered Mrs. Boffin. "'No, ma'am. Most willingly, most thankfully, with all my heart and soul.' So they kissed him, and left him there, and old Betty was to come back early in the morning. And nobody but Rokesmith knew for certain how that the doctor had said, this should have been days ago, too late. But Rokesmith knowing it, and knowing that his bearing it in mind would be acceptable thereafter to that good woman who had been the only light in the childhood of desolate John Harmon dead and gone, resolved that late at night he would go back to the bedside of John Harmon's namesake, and see how it fared with him. The family whom God had brought together were not all asleep, but were all quiet. From bed to bed, a light womanly tread and a pleasant fresh face passed in the silence of the night. A little head would lift itself up into the softened light here and there, to be kissed as the face went by, for these little patients are very loving and would then submit itself to be composed to rest again. The mite with the broken leg was restless, and moaned, but after a while turned his face towards Johnny's bed, to fortify himself with a view of the ark, and fell asleep. Over most of the beds the toys were yet grouped as the children had left them, when they last laid themselves down, and, in their innocent grotesqueness and incongruity, they might have stood for the children's dreams. The doctor came in, too, to see how it fared with Johnny, and he and Rokesmith stood together, looking down with compassion on him. "'What—what what is it, Johnny?' Rokesmith was the questioner, and put an arm round the poor baby as he made a struggle. "'Him,' said the little fellow. "'Those—' The doctor was quick to understand children, and, taking the horse, the ark, the yellow bird, and the man in the guards, from Johnny's bed, softly placed them on that of his next neighbour, the mite with the broken leg. With a weary and yet a pleased smile, and with an action as if he stretched his little figure out to rest, the child heaved his body on the sustaining arm, and seeking Rokesmith's face with his lips, said, "'A kiss for the boofer, lady.' Having now bequeathed all he had to dispose of, and arranged his affairs in this world, Johnny, thus speaking, left it. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather, Chapter Ten, A Successor some of the Reverend Frank Milvey's brethren had found themselves exceedingly uncomfortable in their minds, because they were required to bury the dead too hopefully. But the Reverend Frank, inclining to the belief that they were required to do one or two other things, say out of nine and thirty, calculated to trouble their consciences rather more if they would think as much about them, held his peace. Indeed, the Reverend Frank Milvey was a forbearing man who noticed many sad warps and blights in the vineyard wherein he worked, and did not profess that they made him savagely wise. He only learned that the more he himself knew, in his little limited human way, the better he could distantly imagine what omniscience might know. Wherefore, if the Reverend Frank had had to read the words that troubled some of his brethren, and profitably touched innumerable hearts, in a worse case than Johnny's, he would have done so out of the pity and humility of his soul. Reading them over Johnny, he thought of his own six children, but not of his poverty, and read them with dimmed eyes. And very seriously did he and his bright little wife, who had been listening, look down into the small grave, 
and walk home arm in arm. There was grief in the aristocratic house, and there was joy in the bower. Mr. Wegg argued, if an orphan were wanted, was he not an orphan himself, and could a better be desired? And why go beating about Brentford bushes, seeking orphans for sooth, who had established no claims upon you, and made no sacrifices for you, when here was an orphan ready to your hand, who had given up in your cause Miss Elizabeth, Master George, Aunt Jane, and Uncle Parker? Mr. Wegg chuckled, consequently, when he heard the tidings. Nay, it was afterwards affirmed by a witness, who shall at present be nameless, that in the seclusion of the bower he poked out his wooden leg, in the stage ballet manner, and executed a taunting or triumphant pirouette on the genuine leg remaining to him. John Rokesmith's manner towards Mrs. Boffin at this time was more the manner of a young man towards a mother than that of a secretary towards his employer's wife. It had always been marked by a subdued affectionate deference that seemed to have sprung up on the very day of his engagement. Whatever was odd in her dress or her ways had seemed to have no oddity for him. He had sometimes borne a quietly amused face in her company, but still it had seemed as if the pleasure her genial temper and radiant nature yielded him could have been quite as naturally expressed in a tear as in a smile. The completeness of his sympathy with her fancy for having a little John Harmon to protect and rear, he had shown in every act and word, and now that the kind fancy was disappointed, he treated it with a manly tenderness and respect for which she could hardly thank him enough. "'But I do thank you, Mr. Rokesmith,' said Mrs. Boffin, "'and I thank you most kindly. You love children?' "'I hope everybody does.' "'They ought.' said Mrs. Boffin, but we don't all of us do what we ought to do us. John Rokesmith replied, Some among us supply the shortcomings of the rest. You have loved children well, Mr. Boffin has told me. Not a bit better than he has, but that's his way. He puts all the good upon me. You speak rather sadly, Mr. Rokesmith. Do I? It sounds to me so. "'Were you one of many children?' He shook his head. "'An only child?' "'No. There was another. Dead long ago.' "'Father or mother alive?' "'Dead.' "'And the rest of your relations?' "'Dead. If I ever had any living, I never heard of any.' At this point of the dialogue, Bella came in with a light step. She paused at the door a moment, hesitating whether to remain or retire, perplexed by finding that she was not observed. "'Now, don't mind an old lady's talk,' said Mrs. Boffin, "'but tell me, are you quite sure, Mr. Rokesmith, that you have never had a disappointment in love?' "'Quite sure. Why do you ask me?' "'Why, for this reason. Sometimes you have a kind of kept down manner with you, which is not like your age. You can't be thirty. I am not yet thirty. Deeming it high time to make her presence known, Bella coughed here to attract attention, begged pardon, and said she would go, fearing that she interrupted some matter of business. Oh, no, don't go, rejoined Mrs. Boffin, because we are coming to business, instead of having begun it and you belong to it as much now, my dear Bella, as I do. But I want my Noddy to consult with us. Would somebody be so good as to find my Noddy for me? Rokesmith departed on that errand, and presently returned, accompanied by Mr. Boffin, at his jog-trot. Bella felt a little vague trepidation as to the subject matter of this same consultation, until Mrs. Boffin announced it. Now! "'You come and sit by me, my dear,' said that worthy soul, taking her comfortable place on a large ottoman in the centre of the room, and drawing her arm through Bella's. "'And Noddy, you sit here, and Mr. Rokesmith, you sit there. Now, you see, what I want to talk about is this. Mr. and Mrs. Milvey have sent me the kindest note possible.' which Mr. Rokesmith just now read to me out aloud, for I ain't good at handwritings, offering to find me another little child to name and educate and bring up. Well, this has set me thinking. 
"'And she's a steam-engine at it,' murmured Mr. Boffin, in an admiring parenthesis. "'When she once begins, it might be so easy to start her, but once started, she's a engine.' "'This has set me thinking, I say,' repeated Mrs. Boffin, cordially beaming under the influence of her husband's compliment. "'And I have thought two things. First of all, that I have grown timid of reviving John Harmon's name. It's an unfortunate name, and I fancy I should reproach myself if I gave it to another dear child, and it proved again unlucky.' "'Now, whether said Mr. Boffin, gravely propounding a case for his secretary's opinion, whether one might call that a superstition? "'It is a matter of feeling with Mrs. Boffin,' said Rokesmith, gently. "'The name has always been unfortunate. It has now this new unfortunate association connected with it. The name has died out. Why revive it? Might I ask Miss Wilfer what she thinks?' "'It has not been a fortunate name for me,' said Bella, colouring. "'Or, at least it was not, until it led to my being here. But that is not the point in my thoughts. As we had given the name to the poor child, and as the poor child took so lovingly to me, I think I should feel jealous of calling another child by it. I think I should feel as if the name had become endeared to me, and I had no right to use it so.' "'And that's your opinion,' remarked Mr. Boffin, observant of the secretary's face, and again addressing him. "'I say again, it is a matter of feeling,' returned the secretary. "'I think Miss Wilfer's feeling very womanly and pretty.' "'Now, give us your opinion, Noddy,' said Mrs. Boffin. "'My opinion, old lady,' returned the golden dustman, "'is your opinion.' "'Then—' said Mrs. Boffin, we agree not to revive John Harmon's name, but to let it rest in the grave. It is, as Mr. Rokesmith says, a matter of feeling. But, law, how many matters are matters of feeling? Well, and so I come to the second thing I've thought of. You must know, Bella, my dear, and Mr. Rokesmith, that when I first named to my husband my thoughts of adopting a little orphan boy, in remembrance of John Harmon, I further named to my husband that it was comforting to think that how the poor boy would be benefited by John's own money, and protected from John's own forlornness. "'Hear, hear!' cried Mr. Boffin. "'So she did. Encore!' "'No, not encore, Noddy, my dear,' returned Mrs. Boffin, "'because I am going to say something else. I mean that, I am sure, as I, much as I still mean it, but this little death has made me ask myself the question seriously whether I wasn't too bent upon pleasing myself. Else, why did I seek out so much for a pretty child, and a child quite to my liking? Wanting to do good, why not do it for its own sake, and put my taste and likings by? Perhaps, said Bella, and perhaps she said it, with some little sensitiveness arising out of those old curious relations of hers towards the murdered man. "'Perhaps, in reviving the name, you would not have liked to give it to a less interesting child than the original. He interested you very much.' "'Well, my dear,' returned Mrs. Boffin, giving her a squeeze, "'it's kind of you to find that reason out, and I hope it may have been so, and indeed to a certain extent.' I believe it was so, but I'm afraid not to the whole extent. However, that don't come in question now, because we have done with the name. Laid it up as a remembrance, suggested Bella musingly. Much better said, my dear, laid it up as a remembrance. Well, then, I've been thinking, if I take any orphan to provide for, let it not be a pet and a plaything for me, but a creature to be helped for its own sake. "'Not pretty, then,' said Bella. "'No,' returned Mrs. Boffin stoutly. "'Nor prepossessing, then?' said Bella. "'No,' returned Mrs. Boffin. "'Not necessarily so. That's as it may happen. A well-disposed boy comes in my way, 
who may be even a little wanting in such advantages for getting on in life, but is honest and industrious, and requires a helping hand, and deserves it. If I am very much in earnest, and quite determined to be unselfish, let me take care of him. Here the footman, whose feelings had been hurt on the former occasion, appeared, and crossing to Rokesmith, apologetically announced the objectionable Sloppy. The four members of council looked at one another, and paused. "'Shall he be brought here, ma'am?' asked Rokesmith. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Boffin, whereupon the footman disappeared, reappeared presenting Sloppy, and retired, much disgusted. The consideration of Mrs. Boffin had clothed Mr. Sloppy in a suit of black, on which the tailor had received personal directions from Rokesmith to expend the utmost cunning of his art with a view to the concealment of the cohering and sustaining buttons. But so much more powerful were the frailties of Sloppy's form, and the strongest resources of tailoring science, that he now stood before the council a perfect Argus in the way of buttons shining and winking and gleaming and twinkling out of a hundred of those eyes of bright metal at the dazzled spectators. The artistic taste of some unknown hatter had furnished him with a hat-band of wholesale capacity, which was fluted behind, from the crown of his hat to the brim, and terminated in a black bunch, from which the imagination shrunk discomforted, and the reason revolted. Some special powers with which his legs were endowed had already hitched up his glossy trousers at the ankles, and bagged them at the knees, while similar gifts in his arms had raised his coat-sleeves from his wrists, and accumulated them at his elbows. Thus set forth, with the additional embellishments of a very little tail to his coat, and a yawning gulf at his waistband, Sloppy stood confessed. "'And how is Betty, my good fellow?' Mrs. Boffin asked him. "'Thank ye, mum,' said Sloppy. "'She do pretty nicely, and send in her duty, and many thanks for the tea, and all the five years, and wishing to know the family's health.' "'Have you just come, Sloppy?' "'Yes, mum.' "'Then you have not had your dinner yet?' "'No, mum, but I mean to, for I ain't forgotten your handsome orders. I was never to go away without having had a good in off of meat and beer and pudding. Oh, no, there was four of them, for I reckon them up when I had em. Uh, meat one, beer two, vegetables three, and which was four? Oh, why, pudding, he was four. Here Sloppy threw his head back, and opened his mouth wide, and laughed rapturously. "'How are the two poor little minders?' asked Mrs. Boffin. "'Striking right out, Mum, and coming round beautiful.' Mrs. Boffin looked on the other three members of council, and then said, beckoning with her finger, "'Sloppy?' "'Yes, Mum.' "'Come forward, Sloppy. Should you like to dine here every day?' "'Off of all four on him, bum? "'Oh, mum!' Sloppy's feelings obliged him to squeeze his hat, and contract one leg at the knee. "'Yes, and should you like to be always taken care of here, if you were industrious and deserving?' "'Oh, mum! "'But there's Mrs. Higgin,' said Sloppy, checking himself in his raptures drawing back, and shaking his head with very serious meaning. "'There's Mrs. Hickton. Mrs. Hickton goes before all. None can ever be better friends to me than Mrs. Higton's been. And she must be turned for, must Mrs. Hickton. Where would Mrs. Higton be if she weren't turned for?' At the mere thought of Mrs. Higton in this inconceivable affliction, Mr. Sloppy's countenance became pale, and manifested the most distressful emotions. "'You are as right as right can be, Sloppy,' said Mrs. Boffin, "'and far be it from me to tell you otherwise. It shall be seen to. If Betty Higdon can be turned for all the same, you shall come here and be taken care of for life, and be made able to keep her in other ways than the turning.' "'Even as to that, Mum,' answered the ecstatic Sloppy, "'the turning might be done in the night, don't you see? "'I could be here in the day, and turning in the night. 
I don't want no sleep, I don't, or even if I anyways should want a wink or two, added Sloppy, after a moment's apologetic reflection, I could take em turning. I've took em turning many a time, and enjoyed em wonderful. On the grateful impulse of the moment, Mr. Sloppy kissed Mrs. Boffin's hand, and then detaching himself from that good creature that he might have room enough for his feelings, threw back his head, opened his mouth wide, and uttered a dismal howl. It was creditable to his tenderness of heart, but suggested that he might on occasion give some offence to the neighbours, the rather as the footman looked in, and begged pardon, finding he was not wanted, but excused himself on the ground that he thought it was cats. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Eleven, Some Affairs of the Heart Little Miss Peacher, from her little official dwelling-house, with its little windows like the eyes in needles, and its little doors like the covers of school-books, was very observant indeed of the object of her quiet affections. Love, though said to be afflicted with blindness, is a vigilant watchman and Miss Peacher kept him on double duty over Mr. Bradley Headstone. It was not that she was naturally given to playing the spy, it was not that she was at all secret, plotting, or mean, it was simply that she loved the irresponsive Bradley with all the primitive and homely stock of love that had never been examined or certificated out of her. If her faithful slate had had the latent qualities of sympathetic paper, and its pencil those of invisible ink, Many a little treatise, calculated to astonish the pupils, would have come bursting through the dry sums in school-time, under the warming influence of Miss Peach's bosom. For oftentimes, when school was not, and her calm leisure and calm little house were her own, Miss Peacher would commit to the confidential slate an imaginary description of how, upon a balmy evening at dusk, two figures might have been observed in the market-garden ground round the corner, of whom one, being a manly form, bent over the other, being a womanly form of short stature and some compactness, and breathed in a low voice the words, Emma Peacher, wilt thou be my own? After which the womanly form's head reposed upon the manly form's shoulder, and the nightingales tuned up. Though all unseen and unsuspected by the pupils, Bradley Headstone even pervaded the school exercises. Was geography in question? He would come triumphantly, flying out of Vesuvius and Etna, ahead of the lava, and would boil unharmed in the hot springs of Iceland, and would float majestically down the Ganges and the Nile. Did history chronicle a king of men? Behold him, in pepper-and-salt pantaloons, with his watch-guard round his neck. Were copies to be written? In capital B's and H's, most of the girls under Miss Peach's tuition were half a year ahead of every other letter in the alphabet and mental arithmetic, administered by Miss Peacher, often devoted itself to providing Bradley Headstone with a wardrobe of fabulous extent. Four score and four neckties at two and ninepence halfpenny, two gross of silver watches at four pounds fifteen and sixpence, seventy-four black hats at eighteen shillings, and many similar superfluities. The vigilant watchman, using his daily opportunities of turning his eyes in Bradley's direction, soon apprised Miss Peacher that Bradley was more preoccupied than had been his wont, and more given to strolling about with a downcast and reserved face, turning something difficult in his mind that was not in the scholastic syllabus. Putting this and that together, combining under the head this present appearances and the intimacy with Charlie Hexham, and ranging under the head that the visit to his sister the watchman reported to Miss Peacher his strong suspicions that the sister was at the bottom of it. "'I wonder,' said Miss Peacher, as she sat making up her weekly report on a half-holiday afternoon, "'what they call Hexham's sister?' Mary Ann, at her needlework, attendant and attentive, held her arm up. "'Well, Mary Ann, she is named Lizzie, ma'am.' "'She can hardly be named Lizzie, I think, Mary Ann,' returned Miss Peacher, in a tunefully instructive voice. "'Is Lizzie a Christian name, Mary Ann?' Mary Ann laid down her work, 
Rose hooked herself behind, as being under categorization, and replied, "'No, it is a corruption, Miss Peacher.' "'Who gave her that name?' Miss Peacher was going on, from the mere force of habit, when she checked herself, on Mary Anne's evincing theological impatience to strike in with her godfathers and her godmothers, and said, "'I mean, of what name is it a corruption?' "'Elizabeth, or Eliza, Miss Peacher.' Right, Mary Ann. Whether there were any Lizzies in the early Christian church must be considered very doubtful, very doubtful. Miss Peacher was exceedingly sage here. Speaking correctly, we say then that Hexham's sister is called Lizzie, not that she is named so. Do we not, Mary Ann? We do, Miss Peacher. And where? pursued Miss Peacher, complacent in her little transparent fiction of conducting the examination in a semi-official manner for Mary Anne's benefit, not her own. "'Where does this young woman, who is called but not named Lizzie, live? Think now, before answering. "'In Church Street, Smith Square, by Millbank, ma'am. "'In Church Street, Smith Square, by Millbank,' repeated Miss Peacher, as if possessed beforehand of the book in which it was written. "'Exactly! so. And what occupation does this young woman pursue, Mary Anne? Take time. She has a place of trust at an outfitter's in the city, ma'am. Oh, said Miss Peacher, pondering on it, but smoothly added in a confirmatory tone, at an outfitter's in the city. Yes. And Charlie, Mary Anne was proceeding when Miss Peacher stared. I mean, Hexham, Miss Peacher. "'I should think you did, Mary Anne, and glad to hear you do. "'And uh, Hexham says,' Mary Anne went on, "'that he is not pleased with his sister, "'and that his sister won't be guided by his advice, "'and persists in being guided by somebody else's, "'and that, Mr. Headstone, coming across the garden,' "'exclaimed Miss Peacher, with a flushed glance at the looking-glass. "'You have answered very well, Mary Anne. "'You are forming an excellent habit of arranging your thoughts clearly. "'That will do.' "'The discreet Mary Anne resumed her seat and her silence, "'and stitched, and stitched, and was stitching, "'when the schoolmaster's shadow came in before him, "'announcing that he might be instantly expected. "'Good evening, Miss Peacher.' he said, pursuing the shadow, and taking its place. "'Good evening, Mr. Headstone. Mary Anne, a chair?' "'Thank you,' said Bradley, seating himself in his constrained manner. "'This is but a flying visit. I have looked in on my way to ask a kindness of you as a neighbour. "'Did you say, on your way, Mr. Headstone?' asked Miss Peacher. "'On my way to where I am going.' "'Church Street, Smith Square, by Millbank,' repeated Miss Peacher, in her own thoughts. "'Charlie Hexham has gone to get a book or two he wants, and will probably be back before me. As we leave my house empty, I took the liberty of telling him I would leave the key here. Would you kindly allow me to do so?' "'Certainly, Mr. Headstone. Going for an evening walk, sir?' "'Partly for a walk, and partly for one business.' "'Business in Church Street, Smith Square, by Millbank,' repeated Miss Peacher to herself. "'Having said which,' pursued Bradley, laying his door-key on the table, "'I must be already going. There is nothing I can do for you, Miss Peacher?' "'Thank you, Mr. Headstone. In which direction?' "'In the direction of Westminster.' "'Millbank,' Miss Peacher repeated in her own thoughts again. "'No, thank you, Mr. Headstone. I'll not trouble you.' "'You couldn't trouble me,' said the schoolmaster. "'Ah,' returned Miss Peacher, though not aloud, "'but you can trouble me.' And for all her quiet manner and her quiet smile, she was full of trouble as he went his way. She was right, touching his destination. He held a straighter course for the house of the doll's dressmaker, as the wisdom of his ancestors— exemplified in the construction of the intervening streets, would let him, and walked with a bent head, hammering at one fixed idea. It had been an immovable idea since he first set eyes upon her. It seemed to him as if all that he could suppress in himself he had suppressed, as if all that he could restrain in himself he had restrained, and the time had come, in a rush, in a moment, 
when the power of self-command had departed from him. Love at first sight is a trite expression, quite sufficiently discussed, enough that in certain smouldering natures like this man's, that passion leaps into a blaze, and makes such head as fire does in a rage of wind, when other passions, but for its mastery, could be held in chains. As a multitude of weak, imitative natures are always lying by, ready to go mad upon the next wrong idea that may be broached, in these times generally some form of tribute to somebody for something that never was done, or, if ever done, that was done by somebody else, so these less ordinary natures may lie by for years, ready on the touch of an instant to burst into flame. The schoolmaster went his way, brooding and brooding, and a sense of being vanquished in a struggle might have been pieced out of his worried face. Truly in his breast there lingered a resentful shame to find himself defeated by this passion for Charlie Hexam's sister, though in the very self-same moments he was concentrating himself upon the object of bringing the passion to a successful issue. He appeared before the doll's dressmaker, sitting alone at her work. Aho! Uh -oh thought that sharp young personage. It's you, is it? I know your tricks and your manners, my friend. Hexam's sister, said Bradley Headstone, is not come home yet. You are quite a conjurer, returned Miss Wren. I will wait, if you please, for I want to speak to her. Do you? returned Miss Wren. Sit down. I hope it's mutual. Badly glanced distrustfully at the shrewd face again bending over the work, and said, trying to conquer doubt and hesitation, "'I hope you don't imply that my visit will be unacceptable to Hexham's sister.' "'There! Don't call her that! I can't bear you to call her that!' returned Miss Wren, snapping her fingers in a volley of impatient snaps. "'For I don't like Hexham.' "'Indeed?' "'No!' Miss Wren wrinkled her nose to express dislike. "'Selfish! Thinks only of himself! The way with all of you!' "'The way with all of us? Then you don't like me?' "'So-so,' replied Miss Wren, with a shrug and a laugh. "'Don't know much about you.' "'But I was not aware it was the way with all of us,' said Bradley, returning to the accusation a little injured. "'Won't you say, some of us?' "'Meaning?' returned the little creature. "'Every one of you, but you! Ha, 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 ha! Now look this lady in the face. This is Mrs. Truth, the Honourable, full-dressed.' Bradley glanced at the doll she held up for his observation, which had been lying on its face on her bench, while with a needle and thread she fastened the dress on at the back, and looked from it to her. "'I stand, the Honourable Mrs. T., on my bench in this corner against the wall, where her blue eyes can shine upon you," pursued Miss Wren, doing so, and making two little dabs at him in the air with her needle, as if she pricked him with it in his own eyes, "'and I defy you to tell me, with Mrs. T. for a witness, what you have come here for.' "'To see Hexham's sister.' "'You don't say so,' retorted Miss Wren, hitching her chin. "'But on whose account?' "'Her own.' "'Oh, Mrs. T.' exclaimed Miss Wren. "'You hear him?' "'To reason with her,' pursued Bradley, half humouring what was present, and half angry with what was not present, for her own sake. "'Oh, Mrs. T.' exclaimed the dressmaker. "'For her own sake,' repeated Bradley, warming, "'and for her brother's, and as a perfectly disinterested person.' "'Really, Mrs. T.' remarked the dressmaker. "'Since it comes to this, we must positively turn you with your face to the wall.' She had hardly done so, when Lizzie Hexham arrived, and showed some surprise on seeing Bradley Headstone there, and Jenny shaking her little fist at him close before her eyes, and the Honourable Mrs. T. with her face to the wall. "'Here's a perfectly disinterested person, Lizzie, dear,' said the knowing Miss Wren. "'Come to talk with you for your own sake and your brother's.' think of that. I'm sure there ought to be no third party present at anything so very kind and so very serious. And so, if you'll remove the third party upstairs, my dear, the third party will retire." Lizzie took the hand which the doll's dressmaker held out to her for the purpose of being supported away, but only looked at her with an inquiring smile, and made no other movement. 
the third party hobbles awfully you know when she's left to herself said miss wren her back being so bad and her legs so queer so she can't retire gracefully unless you help her lizzie she can do no better than stay where she is returned lizzie releasing the hand and laying her own lightly on miss jenny's curls and then to bradley from charley sir in an irresolute way and stealing a clumsy look at her bradley rose to place a chair for her and then returned to his own "'Strictly speaking,' said he, "'I come from Charlie, because I left him only a little while ago. "'But I am not commissioned by Charlie. "'I come of my own spontaneous act.' "'With her elbows on her bench, and her chin upon her hands, "'Miss Jenny Wren sat looking at him with a watchful, sidelong look. "'Lizzie, in her different way, sat looking at him, too. "'The fact is,' began Bradley, with a mouth so dry that he had some difficulty in articulating his words, the consciousness of which rendered his manner still more ungainly and undecided. "'The truth is that th Charlie, having no secrets from me, to the best of my belief, has confided th the whole of this matter to me.' He came to a stop, and Lizzie asked, "'What matter, sir?' "'I thought,' returned the schoolmaster, stealing another look at her, and seeming to try in vain to sustain it, for the look dropped as it lighted on her eyes, "'that it might be so superfluous to, as to be almost impertinent to enter upon a definition of it. My allusion was to this matter of your having put aside your brother's plans for you, and given the preference to those of Mr. I believe the name is Mr. Eugene Rayburn. He made this point of not being certain of the name, with another uneasy look at her, which dropped like the last. Nothing being said on the other side, he had to begin again, and began with new embarrassment. Your brother's plans were communicated to me when he first had them in his thoughts. In point of fact, he spoke to me about them when I was last here, when we were walking back together, and when I, when the impression was fresh upon me of having seen his sister. There might have been no meaning in it, but the little dressmaker here removed one of her supporting hands from her chin, and musingly turned the Honourable Mrs. T. with her face to the company. That done, she fell into her former attitude. "'I approved of his idea,' said Bradley, with his uneasy look wandering to the doll, and unconsciously resting there longer than it had rested on Lizzie. "'Both because your brother ought, naturally, to be the originator of any such scheme, and because I hoped to be able to promote it. I should have had inexpressible pleasure, I should have taken inexpressible interest in promoting it. Therefore I must acknowledge that when your brother was disappointed, uh, I too was disappointed. I wish to avoid reservation or concealment, and I fully acknowledge that.' He appeared to have encouraged himself by having got so far. At all events he went on with much greater firmness and force of emphasis, though with a curious disposition to set his teeth, and with a curious tight-screwing movement of his right hand in the clenching palm of his left, like the action of one who was being physically hurt, and was unwilling to cry out. "'I am a man of strong feelings, and I have strongly felt this disappointment. I do strongly feel it. I don't show what I feel. Some of us are obliged habitually to keep it down, to keep it down. But to return to your brother. He has taken the matter so much to heart that he has remonstrated, in my presence he remonstrated, with Mr. Eugene Rayburn, if that be the name. He did so quite ineffectually. Has any one not blinded to the real character of Mr. Mr. Eugene Rayburn would readily suppose. He looked at Lizzie again, and held the look, and his face turned from burning red to white, and from white back to burning red, and so for the time to lasting deadly white. Finally, I resolved to come here alone and appeal to you. I resolved to come here alone and entreat you to retract the course you have chosen, and instead of confiding in a mere stranger, 
a person of most insolent behaviour to your brother and others, to prefer your brother and your brother's friend. Lizzie Hexam had changed colour when those changes came over him, and her face now expressed some anger, more dislike, and even a touch of fear, but she answered him very steadily. "'I cannot doubt, Mr. Headstone, that your visit is well meant. You have been so good a friend to Charlie that I have no right to doubt it. I have nothing to tell Charlie, but that I accepted the help to which he so much objects before he made any plans for me, or certainly before I knew of any. It was considerately and delicately offered, and there were reasons that had weight with me which should be as dear to Charlie as to me. I have no more to say to Charlie on this subject. His lips trembled and stood apart, as he followed this repudiation of himself and limitation of her words to her brother. "'I should have told Charlie, if he had come to me,' she resumed, as though it were an afterthought, "'that Jenny and I find our teacher very able and very patient, and that she takes great pains with us. So much so that we have said to her we hope in a very little while to be able to go on by ourselves. Charlie knows about teachers, and I should also have told him, for his satisfaction, that ours comes from an institution where teachers are regularly brought up. "'I should like to ask you,' said Bradley Headstone, grinding his words slowly out, as though they came from a rusty mill, "'I should like to ask you, if I may, without offence, whether you would have objected. No, rather, I should like to say, if I may, without offence, that I wish I had had the opportunity of coming here with your brother, and devoting my poor abilities and experience to your service. Thank you, Mr. Headstone. But I fear, he pursued after a pause, furtively wrenching at the seat of his chair with one hand, as if he would have wrenched the chair to pieces, and gloomily observing her while her eyes were cast down, that my humble services would not have found much favour with you. She made no reply, and the poor stricken wretch sat contending with himself in a heat of passion and torment. After a while he took out his handkerchief, and wiped his forehead and hands. "'There is—' Only one thing more, I had to say, but it is the most important. There is a reason against this matter. There is a personal relation concerned in this matter, not yet explained to you. It might—I don't say it would—it might—induce you to think differently. To proceed under the present circumstances is out of the question. Will you please come to the understanding that there shall be another interview on the subject? With Charlie, Mr. Headstone? With— Well, he answered, breaking off. Yes, say with him, too. Will you please come to the understanding that there must be another interview, under more favourable circumstances, before the whole case can be submitted? I don't, said Lizzie, shaking her head. "'Understand your meaning, Mr. Headstone.' "'Limit my meaning for the present,' he interrupted, "'to the whole case being submitted to you in another interview.' "'What case, Mr. Headstone? What is wanting to it?' "'You—you you shall be informed in the other interview.' Then he said, as if in a burst of irrepressible despair, "'I—I I leave it all incomplete. There is a spell upon me, I think.' and then added, almost as if he asked for pity, "'Good night!' He held out his hand, as she, with manifest hesitation, not to say reluctance, touched it. A strange tremble passed over him, and his face, so deadly white, was moved as by a stroke of pain. Then he was gone. The doll's dressmaker sat with her attitude unchanged, eyeing the door by which he had departed, until Lizzie pushed her bench aside and sat down near her. Then, eyeing Lizzie, as she had previously eyed Bradley in the door, Miss Wren chopped that very sudden and keen chop in which her jaws sometimes indulged, leaning back in her chair with folded arms, and thus expressed herself. Hm! 
If he, I mean, of course, my dear, the party who is coming to court me, when the time comes, should be that sort of man, he may spare himself the trouble. He wouldn't do to be trotted about and made useful. He'd take fire and blow up, while he was about it. "'And so you would be rid of him,' said Lizzie, humouring her. "'Not so easily.' returned Miss Wren. "'He wouldn't blow up alone. He'd carry me up with him. I know his tricks and his manners.' "'Would he want to hurt you, do you mean?' asked Lizzie. "'Mightn't exactly want to do it, my dear,' returned Miss Wren. "'But a lot of gunpowder among lighted lucifer matches in the next room might almost as well be here.' "'He is a very strange man,' said Lizzie thoughtfully. "'I wish he was so very strange a man as to be a total stranger,' answered the sharp little thing. It being Lizzie's regular occupation, when they were alone of an evening, to brush out and smooth the long fair hair of the doll's dressmaker, she unfastened a ribbon that kept it back while the little creature was at her work, and it fell in a beautiful shower over the poor shoulders that were much in need of such a dawning rain. "'Not now, Lizzie, dear,' said Jenny. "'Let us have a talk by the fire.' With those words she in her turn loosened her friend's dark hair, and it dropped of its own weight over her bosom in two rich masses. Pretending to compare the colours and admire the contrast, Jenny so managed a mere touch or two of her nimble hands, as that she herself, laying a cheek on one of the dark folds, seemed blinded by her own clustering curls to all but the fire, while the fine handsome face and brow of Lizzie were revealed without obstruction in the sombre light. "'Let us have a talk,' said Jenny, "'about Mr. Eugene Rayburn.' Something sparkled down among the fair hair resting on the dark hair, and if it were not a star, which it couldn't be, it was an eye, and if it were an eye, it was Jenny Wren's eye, bright and watchful as the birds whose name she had taken. "'Why, about Mr. Rayburn?' Lizzie asked. "'For no better reason than because I'm in the humour. I wonder whether he's rich.' "'No, not rich.' "'Poor?' "'I think so, for a gentleman.' "'Ah, oh, to be sure, yes, he's a gentleman. Not of our sort, is he?' A shake of the head, a thoughtful shake of the head, and the answer softly spoken, "'Oh, no, oh, no.' The doll's dressmaker had an arm round her friend's waist. Adjusting the arm, she slyly took the opportunity of blowing at her own hair where it fell over her face. Then the eye down there, under lighter shadows, sparkled more brightly and appeared more watchful. "'When he turns up, he shan't be a gentleman. I'll very soon send him packing if he is. However, he's not Mr. Rayburn. I haven't captivated him. I wonder whether anybody has, Lizzie. "'It is very likely.' "'Is it very likely? I wonder who. "'Is it not very likely that some lady has been taken by him, "'and that he may love her dearly? "'Perhaps. I don't know. "'What would you think of him, Lizzie, if you were a lady?' "'I, a lady,' she repeated, laughing. "'Such a fancy.' "'Yes, but say, just as a fancy, and for instance.' I, a lady. I, a poor girl who used to row poor father on the river. I, who had rowed poor father out and home on the very night when I saw him for the first time. I, who was made so timid by his looking at me, that I got up and went out. He did look at you, even that night, though you were not a lady, thought Miss Wren. I, a lady, Lizzie went on in a low voice with her eyes upon the fire. I, with poor father's grave, not even cleared of undeserved stain and shame, and he trying to clear it for me. I, a lady. Only as a fancy, and for instance, urged Miss Wren. Too much, Jenny, dear, too much. I fancy he's not able to get that far. As the low fire gleamed upon her, it showed her smiling mournfully and abstractedly. "'But I'm in the humour, and I must be humoured, Lizzie, because, after all, I am a poor little thing, and I have a hard day with my bad child. Look in the fire,' 
as I like to hear you tell how you used to do, when you lived in that dreary old house that had once been a windmill. Look in the—what was its name when you told fortunes with your brother that I don't like? The Hollow, down by the flare. Ah, oh, that's the name. You can find a lady there, I know. More easily than I can make one of such material as myself, Jenny. The sparkling eye looked steadfastly up, as the musing face looked thoughtfully down. Well, said the doll's dressmaker, we have found our lady. Lizzie nodded and asked, Shall she be rich? She had better be, as he's poor. She is very rich. Shall she be handsome? Even you can be that, Lizzie, so she ought to be. She is very handsome. What does she say about him? asked Miss Jenny, in a low voice, watchful, through an intervening silence, of the face looking down at the fire. She is glad, glad to be rich, that he may have the money. She is glad, glad to be beautiful, that he may be proud of her. Her poor heart. Hey, her poor heart, said Miss Wren, her heart is given him, with all its love and truth. She would joyfully die with him, or, better than that, die for him. She knows he has failings, but she thinks they have grown up through his being like one cast away, for the want of something to trust in, and care for, and think well of. And she says, that lady, rich and beautiful, that I can never come near her, only put me in that empty place, only try how little I mind myself, only prove what a world of things I will do and bear for you, and I hope that you might even come to be much better than you are, through me, who am so much worse, and hardly worth the thinking of beside you. As the face looking at the fire had become exalted and forgetful in the rapture of these words, the little creature, openly clearing away her fair hair with her disengaged hand, had gazed at it with earnest attention, and something like alarm. Now that the speaker ceased, the little creature laid down her head again, and moaned, "'Oh, me! Oh, me! Oh, me!' "'In pain, dear Jenny?' asked Lizzie, as if awakened. "'Yes, but not the old pain. Lay me down, lay me down.' Don't go out of my sight to-night. Lock the door, and keep close to me." Then turning away her face, she said in a whisper to herself, "'My Lizzie! My poor Lizzie! Oh, my blessed children! Come back in the long bright slanting rose, and come for her, not me. She wants help more than I, my blessed children. She had stretched her hands up with that higher and better look, and now she turned again, and folded them round Lizzie's neck, and rocked herself on Lizzie's breast. End of Book Two, Chapter Eleven Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Twelve, More Birds of Prey Rogue Riderhood dwelt deep and dark in Limehouse Hole, among the riggers, and the mast, oar and block-makers, and the boat-builders, and the sail-lofts, as in a kind of ship's hold stored full of waterside characters, some no better than himself, some very much better, and none much worse. The whole, albeit in a general way not over-nice in its choice of company, was rather shy in reference to the honour of cultivating the rogue's acquaintance, more frequently giving him the cold shoulder than the warm hand, and seldom or never drinking with him unless at his own expense. A part of the whole, indeed, contained so much public spirit and private virtue, that not even this strong leverage could move it to good fellowship with a tainted accuser. But there may have been the drawback on this magnanimous morality, that its exponents held a true witness before justice to be the next unneighbourly and accursed character to a false one. Had it not been for the daughter whom he often mentioned, 
Mr. Riderhood might have found the whole a mere grave as to any means it would yield him of getting a living. But Miss Pleasant Riderhood had some little position and connection in Limehouse Hole. Upon the smallest of small scales she was an unlicensed pawnbroker, keeping what was popularly called a leaving shop, by lending insignificant sums on insignificant articles of property deposited with her as security. In her four-and-twentieth year of life, Pleasant was already in her fifth year of this way of trade. Her deceased mother had established the business, and on that parent's demise she had appropriated a secret capital of fifteen shillings to establishing herself in it. The existence of such capital in a pillow being the last intelligible confidential communication made to her by the departed, before succumbing to dropsical conditions of snuff and gin, incompatible equally with coherence and existence. Why christened Pleasant? The late Mrs. Riderhood might possibly have been at some time able to explain, and possibly not. Her daughter had no information on that point. Pleasant she found herself, and she couldn't help it. She had not been consulted on the question any more than on the question of her coming into these terrestrial parts to want a name. Similarly, she found herself possessed of what is colloquially termed a swivel eye, derived from her father, which she might perhaps have declined if her sentiments on the subject had been taken. She was not otherwise positively ill-looking, though anxious, meagre, of a muddy complexion, and looking as old again as she really was. As some dogs have it in the blood, or are trained, to worry certain creatures to a certain point, so, not to make the comparison disrespectfully, Pleasant Riderhood had it in the blood, or had been trained, to regard seamen within certain limits as her prey. Show her a man in a blue jacket, and, figuratively speaking, she pinned him instantly. Yet, all things considered, she was not of an evil mind or an unkindly disposition. For, observe how many things were to be considered according to her own unfortunate experience. Show Pleasant Riderhood a wedding in the street, and she only saw two people taking out a regular license to quarrel and fight. Show her a christening, and she saw a little heathen personage having a quiet superfluous name bestowed upon it, inasmuch as it would be commonly addressed by some abusive epithet, which little personage was not in the least wanted by anybody, and would be shoved and banged out of everybody's way, until it should grow big enough to shove and bang. Show her a funeral, and she saw an unremunerative ceremony, in the nature of a black masquerade, conferring a temporary gentility on the performers, at an immense expense, and representing the only formal party ever given by the deceased. Show her a live father, and she saw but a duplicate of her own father, who from her infancy had been taken with fits and starts of discharging his duty to her, which duty was always incorporated in the form of a fist or a leathern strap, and being discharged hurt her. All things considered, therefore, Pleasant Riderhood was not so very, very bad. There was even a touch of romance in her, of such romance as could creep into Limehouse Hole, and maybe sometimes of a summer evening, when she stood with folded arms at her shop door, looking from the reeking street to the sky, where the sun was setting, she may have had some vaporous visions of far-off islands in the southern seas, or elsewhere, not being geographically particular, where it would be good to roam with a congenial partner among groves of bread-fruit, waiting for ships to be wafted from the hollow ports of civilization, for sailors to be got the better of were essential to Miss Pleasant's Eden. Not on a summer evening did she come to her little shop door, when a certain man, standing over against the house on the opposite side of the street, took notice of her. That was on a cold, shrewd, windy evening, after dark. Pleasant Riderhood shared with most of the lady inhabitants of the whole the peculiarity that her hair was a ragged knot, constantly coming down behind, and that she never could enter upon any undertaking without first twisting it into place. At that particular moment, being newly come to the threshold to take a look out of doors, she was winding herself up with both hands after this fashion. And so prevalent was the fashion, that on the occasion of a fight or other disturbance in the hole, the ladies would be seen flocking from all quarters, universally twisting their back hair as they came along, and many of them, in the hurry of the moment, carrying their back combs in their mouths. It was a wretched little shop with a roof that any man standing in it could touch with his hand, little better than a cellar or cave, 
down three steps. Yet in its ill-lighted window, among a flaring handkerchief or two, an old peacoat or so, a few valueless watches and compasses, a jar of tobacco and two crossed pipes, a bottle of walnut ketchup, and some horrible sweets, these creature discomforts, serving as a blind to the main business of the leaving shop, was displayed the inscription, Seaman's Boarding House. Taking notice of Pleasant Riderhood at the door, the man crossed so quickly that she was still winding herself up when he stood close before her. "'Is your father at home?' said he. Oh, "'I think he is,' returned Pleasant, dropping her arms. "'Come in.' It was a tentative reply, the man having a seafaring appearance. Her father was not at home, and Pleasant knew it. "'Take a seat by the fire,' were her hospitable words, when she had got him in. "'Men of your calling are always welcome here.' "'Thank ye,' said the man. His manner was the manner of a sailor and his hands were the hands of a sailor, except that they were smooth. Pleasant had an eye for sailors, and she noticed the unused colour and texture of the hands, sunburnt though they were, as sharply as she noticed their unmistakable looseness and suppleness, as he sat himself down with his left arm carelessly thrown across his left leg, a little above the knee, and the right arm as carelessly thrown over the elbow of the wooden chair, with the hand curved, half open and half shut, as if it had just let go a rope. "'Might you be looking for a boarding-house?' Pleasant inquired, taking her observant stand on one side of the fire. "'I don't rightly know my plans yet,' returned the man. "'You ain't looking for a leaving shop?' "'No,' said the man. "'No,' assented Pleasant. "'You've got too much of an outfit on you for that. But if you should want either, this is both.' "'Aye, aye.' said the man, glancing round the place. "'I know. I've been here before.' "'Did you leave anything when you were here before?' asked Pleasant, with a view to principle and interest. "'No,' the man shook his head. "'I'm pretty sure you never boarded here.' "'No,' the man again shook his head. "'What did you do here when you were here before?' asked Pleasant. "'For I don't remember you.' "'It's not at all likely you should. I only stood at the door one night, on the lower step there, while a shipmate of mine looked in to speak to your father. I remember the place well, looking very curiously round it. "'Might that have been long ago?' "'Aye, a goodish bit ago, when I came off my last voyage.' "'Then you have not been to sea lately?' "'No. Been in the sick bay since then, and been employed ashore.' "'Then, to be sure, that accounts for your hands.' The man, with a keen look, a quick smile, and a change of manner, caught her up. "'You're a good observer. Yes, that accounts for my hands.' Pleasant was somewhat disquieted by his look, and returned it suspiciously. Not only was his change of manner, though very sudden, quite collected, but his former manner, which he resumed, had a certain suppressed confidence and sense of power in it, that were half-threatening. "'Will your father be long?' he inquired. "'I don't know. I can't say.' "'As you supposed he was at home, it would seem that he has just gone out. How's that?' "'I suppose he had come home,' Pleasant explained. "'Oh, you supposed he had come home? He has been some time out? How's that?' "'I don't want to deceive you, fathers, on the river in his boat.' "'At the old work?' asked the man. "'I don't know what you mean,' said Pleasant, shrinking a step back. "'What on earth do you want?' "'I don't want to hurt your father. I don't want to say I might, if I chose. I want to speak to him. Not much in that, is there? There shall be no secrets from you. You shall be by. And plainly, Miss Riderhood, there's nothing to be got out of me, or made of me. I'm not good for the leaving shop. I'm not good for the boarding-house. I'm not good for anything in your way, to the extent of sixpenneth of halfpence. Put the idea aside, and we shall get on together. But you're a seafaring man, argued Pleasant, as if that were a sufficient reason for his being good for something in her way. Yes and no. I have been, and I may be again. But I'm not for you. Won't you take my word for it? 
The conversation had arrived at a crisis to justify Miss Pleasant's hair in tumbling down. It tumbled down accordingly, and she twisted it up, looking from under her bent forehead at the man. In taking stock of his familiarly worn, rough-weather nautical clothes, piece by piece, she took stock of a formidable knife in a sheath at his waist, ready to his hand, and of a whistle hanging round his neck, and of a short, jagged, knotted club with a loaded head that peeped out of a pocket of his loose outer jacket or frock. He sat quietly looking at her, but, with these appendages partially revealing themselves, and with a quantity of bristling oakum-coloured head and whisker, he had a formidable appearance. "'Won't you take my word for it?' he asked again. Pleasant answered with a short, dumb nod. He rejoined with another short, dumb nod. Then he got up, and stood with his arms folded in front of the fire, looking down into it occasionally, as she stood with her arms folded, leaning against the side of the chimney-piece. "'To while away the time till your father comes,' he said. "'Pray, is there much robbing and murdering of seamen about the waterside now?' "'No,' said Pleasant. "'Any?' "'Complaints of that sort are sometimes made, about Ratcliffe and Wapping and up that way, but who knows how many are true?' "'To be sure. And it don't seem necessary.' "'That's what I say,' observed Pleasant. "'Where's the reason for it? Bless the sailors. It ain't as if they ever could keep what they have without it. "'You're right. Their money may be soon got out of them without violence,' said the man. "'Of course it may,' said Pleasant. "'And then they ship again, and get more. And the best thing for em too, to ship again as soon as ever they can be brought to it. They're never so well off as when they're afloat.' "'I'll tell you why I ask.' pursued the visitor, looking up from the fire. "'I was once beset that way myself, and left for dead.' "'No,' said Pleasant. "'Where did it happen?' "'It happened,' returned the man, with a ruminative air, as he drew his right hand across his chin, and dipped the other in the pocket of his rough outer coat. "'It happened somewhere about here, as I reckon. I don't think it can have been a mile from here.' "'Were you drunk?' asked Pleasant. I was muddled, but not with fair drinking. I had not been drinking, you understand. A mouthful did it. Pleasant, with a grave look, shook her head, importing that she understood the process, but decidedly disapproved. "'Fair trade is one thing,' said she, "'but that's another. No one has a right to carry on with Jack in that way.' "'The sentiment does you credit.' returned the man, with a grim smile, and added in a mutter, "'The more so, as I believe it's not your father's.' "'Yes, I had a bad time of it, that time. I lost everything, and had a sharp struggle for my life, weak as I was.' "'Did you get the parties punished?' asked Pleasant. "'A tremendous punishment followed,' said the man, more seriously. "'But it was not of my bringing about.' "'Of whose, then?' asked Pleasant. The man pointed upward with his forefinger, and, slowly recovering that hand, settled his chin in it again as he looked at the fire. Bringing her inherited eye to bear upon him, Pleasant Riderhood felt more and more uncomfortable. His manner was so mysterious, so stern, so self-possessed. "'Anyways,' said the damsel. I am glad punishment followed, and I say so, fair trade with seafaring men gets a bad name through deeds of violence. I am as much against deeds of violence being done to seafaring men as seafaring men can be themselves. I am of the same opinion as my mother was when she was living. Fair trade, my mother used to say, but no robbery and no blows. In the way of trade, Miss Pleasant would have taken, and indeed did take, when she could, as much as thirty shillings a week for board, that would be dear at five, and likewise conducted the leaving business upon correspondingly equitable principles. Yet she had that tenderness of conscience, and those feelings of humanity, at the moment her ideas of trade were overstepped, she became the seaman's champion, even against her father, whom she seldom otherwise resisted. But she was here interrupted by her father's voice, exclaiming angrily, "'Now, Paul Parrot!' 
and by her father's hat being heavily flung from his hand and striking her face. Accustomed to such occasional manifestations of his sense of parental duty, Pleasant merely wiped her face on her hair, which, of course, had tumbled down, before she twisted it up. This was another common procedure on the part of the ladies of the whole, when heated by verbal or fistic altercation. "'Blessed if I believe such a pole parrot as you was ever learnt to speak,' growled Mr. Riderhood, stooping to pick up his hat, and making a feint at her with his head and right elbow, for he took the delicate subject of robbing seamen in extraordinary dudgeon, and was out of humour too. "'What are you pole parroting at now? Ain't you got nothing to do but fold your arms and stand a pole parroting all night?' "'Let her alone,' urged the man. She was only speaking to me. "'Let her alone, too,' retorted Mr. Riderhood, eyeing him all over. "'Do you know she's my daughter?' "'Yes.' "'And do you know that I won't have no Paul Perrin on the part of my daughter? No, nor yet that I won't take no Paul Perrin from no man. And who may you be, and what may you want?' "'How can I tell you until you're silent?' returned the other fiercely. "'Well,' said Mr. Riderhood, quailing a little, "'I am willing to be silent for the purpose of hearing, but don't Paul Parrot me.' "'Are you thirsty, you?' the man asked in the same fierce short way, after returning his look. "'Why, naturally,' said Mr. Riderhood, "'ain't I always thirsty?' indignant at the absurdity of the question. "'What will you drink?' demanded the man. "'Sherry wine,' returned Mr. Riderhood in the same sharp tone, "'if you're capable of it.' The man put his hand in his pocket, took out half a sovereign, and begged the favour of Miss Pleasant that she would fetch a bottle. "'With the cork undrawn,' he added, emphatically, looking at her father. "'I'll take my Alfred David.' muttered Mr. Riderhood, slowly relaxing into a dark smile, "'that you know a move. Do I know you? Mm, no, I don't know you,' the man replied. "'No, you don't know me.' And so they stood looking at one another, surlily enough, until Pleasant came back. "'There's small glasses on the shelf,' said Riderhood to his daughter. "'Give me the one without a foot.' I gets me living by the sweat of my brow, and it's good enough for me." This had a modest, self-denying appearance, but it soon turned out that as, by reason of the impossibility of standing the glass upright, while there was anything in it, it required to be emptied as soon as filled, Mr. Riderhood managed to drink in the proportion of three to one. With his Fortunatus's goblet ready in his hand, Mr. Riderhood sat down on one side of the table before the fire and the strange man on the other, Pleasant occupying a stool between the latter and the fireside. The background, composed of handkerchiefs, coats, shirts, hats, and other old articles, on leaving, had a general dim resemblance to human listeners, especially where a shiny black sou'wester suit and hat hung, looking very like a clumsy mariner with his back to the company, who was so curious to overhear that he paused for the purpose with his coat half pulled on, and his shoulders up to his ears in the uncompleted action. The visitor first held the bottle against the light of the candle, and next examined the top of the cork. Satisfied that it had not been tampered with, he slowly took from his breast pocket a rusty clasp-knife, and, with a corkscrew in the handle, opened the wine. That done, he looked at the cork, unscrewed it from the corkscrew, laid each separately on the table, and, with the end of the sailor's knot of his neckerchief, dusted the inside of the neck of the bottle. All this with great deliberation. At first Riderhood had sat, with his footless glass extended at arm's length for filling, while the very deliberate stranger seemed absorbed in his preparations. But gradually his arm reverted home to him, and his glass was lowered and lowered, until he rested it upside down upon the table. By the same degrees his attention became concentrated on the knife. And now, as the man held out the bottle to fill all round, Riderhood stood up, leaned over the table to look closer at the knife, and stared from it to him. "'What's the matter?' asked the man. "'Why, I know that knife,' said Riderhood. "'Yes, 
I dare say you do. He motioned to him to hold up his glass, and filled it. Rider had emptied it to the last drop, and began again. That there knife— Stop, said the man composedly. I was going to drink to your daughter. Your health, Miss Riderhood. That knife was the knife of a seaman named George Redfoot. It was. That seaman was well be known to me. He was. What's come to him? Death has come to him. Death came to him in an ugly shape. He looked, said the man, very horrible after it. Ought a what? said Riderhood, with a frowning stare. After he was killed. Killed? Who killed him? Only answering with a shrug, the man filled the footless glass, and Riderhood emptied it, looking amazedly from his daughter to his visitor. You don't mean to tell an honest man. He was recommencing with his empty glass in his hand, when his eye became fascinated by the stranger's outer coat. He leaned across the table to see it nearer, touched the sleeve, turned the cuff to look at the sleeve lining, the man in his perfect composure offering not the least objection, and exclaimed, "'It's my belief, as this here coat was George Redfoot's, too.' "'You're right. He wore it the last time you ever saw him, and the last time you ever will see him in this world.' "'It's my belief, you mean to tell me, that my face, you killed him?' exclaimed Riderhood, but nevertheless allowing his glass to be filled again. The man only answered with another shrug, and showed no symptom of confusion. "'Wish I may die if I know what to be up to with this chap,' said Riderhood, after staring at him, and tossing his last glassful down his throat. "'Let's know what to make of you. Say something plain.' "'I will,' returned the other, leaning forward across the table, and speaking in a low, impressive voice. "'What a liar you are!' The honest witness rose, and made as though he would fling his glass in the man's face. The man, not wincing, and merely shaking his forefinger half knowingly, half menacingly, the piece of honesty thought better of it, and sat down again, putting the glass down too. "'And when you went to that lawyer yonder in the temple with that invented story,' said the stranger, in an exasperatingly comfortable sort of confidence, "'you might have had your strong suspicions of a friend of your own, you know? I think you had, you know.' "'Me? My suspicions? Of what friend?' "'Tell me again whose knife was this?' demanded the man. "'He was possessed by, and was the property of uh, him, as I have made mention on,' said Riderhood, stupidly evading the actual mention of the name. "'Tell me again whose coat was this?' "'That their article of clothing likewise belonged to, and was wore by, him, as I have made mention on,' was again the dull old Bailey evasion. "'I suspect that you gave him the credit of the deed.' and of keeping cleverly out of the way. But there was small cleverness in his keeping out of the way. The cleverness would have been to have got back for one single instant to the light of the sun. "'Things is come to a pretty pass,' growled Mr. Riderhood, rising to his feet, goaded to stand at bay, "'when bulliers as are wearing dead man's clothes, and bulliers as is armed with dead men's knives, is to come into the houses of honest live men, getting their livings by the sweats of their brows, and is to make this here sort of charges with no rhyme and no reason, neither the one nor yet the other. Why should I have had my suspicions of him?' "'Because you knew him,' replied the man because you had been one with him, and knew his real character under a fair outside, because on the night which you had afterwards reason to believe to be the very night of the murder, you came in here, within an hour of his having left his ship in the docks, and asked you in what lodgings he could find room. Was there no stranger with him? "'I'll take my world without end everlasting, Alfred David, that you want with him.' answered Riderhood. "'You talk big, you do, but things look pretty black against yourself, to my thinking. You charge again me that George Radfoot got lost sight of, and was no more thought of, 
What's that for a sailor? Why, there's fifty such, out of sight and out of mind, ten times as long as him, through entering in different names, re-shipping when the outward voyage is made, and what not, a turning up to light every day about here, and no matter made of it. Ask my daughter. You could go on Paul parroting enough with her when I weren't come in. Paul parrot a little with her on this pint. You and your suspicions of my suspicions of him. What are my suspicions of you? You tell me George Radford got killed. I ask you who done it, and how you know it. You carry his knife, and you wear his coat. I ask you how you can buy him. And over that there bottle. Here Mr. Riderhood appeared to labour under a virtuous delusion that it was his own property. "'And you,' he added, turning to his daughter as he filled the footless glass, "'if it weren't wasting good sherry wine on you, I'd chuck this at you for Paul Parrotin' with this man. It's along of Paul Parrotin' that such like as him gets their suspicions, whereas I gets mine by argument, and being naturally honest man, and sweating away at the brow as an honest man ought.' Here he filled the footless goblet again, and stood chewing one half of its contents, and looking down into the other, as he slowly rolled the wine about in the glass, while Pleasant, whose sympathetic hair had come down on her being apostrophised, rearranged it, much in the style of the tail of a horse, when proceeding to market to be sold. "'Well, have you finished?' asked the strange man. "'No,' said Riderhood. "'I ain't. Far from it. Now, then.' I want to know how George Radfoot come by his death, and how you come by his kit. If you ever do know, you won't know now. And next I want to know, proceeded Riderhood, whether you means to charge that what you may call it murder. Harm and murder, father, suggested Pleasant. No, Paul Perrotin, he vociferated in return. Keep your mouth shut. I want to know, you, sir, whether you charge that there crime on George Radford. If you ever do know, you won't know now. Perhaps you done it yourself, said Riderhood, with a threatening action. I alone know, returned the man, sternly shaking his head. The mysteries of that crime, I alone know that your trumped-up story cannot possibly be true. I alone know that it must be altogether false, and that you must know it to be altogether false. I come here to-night to tell you so much of what I know, and no more." Mr. Riderhood, with his crooked eye upon his visitor, meditated for some moments, and then refilled his glass, and tipped the contents down his throat in three tips. "'Shut the shop-door,' he then said to his daughter, putting the glass suddenly down, "'and turn the key and stand by it. If you know all this, you, sir, getting, as he spoke, between the visitor and the door, why and not you gone a lawyer lywood? That also is alone known to myself, was the cool answer. Don't you know that if you didn't do the deed, what you say you could tell is worth from five to ten thousand pounds? asked Riderhood. I know it very well, and when I claim the money, you shall share it." The honest man paused, and drew a little nearer to the visitor, and a little further from the door. "'I know it,' repeated the man quietly, "'as well as I know that you and George Radfoot were one together in more than one dark business, and as well as I know that you, Roger Riderhood, conspired against an innocent man for blood-money and as well as I know that, I can, and that I swear I will, give you up on both scores, and be the proof against you in my own person, if you defy me." "'Father,' cried Pleasant from the door, "'don't defy him. Give way to him. Don't get into more trouble, father.' "'Will you leave off a pole parroting, I ask you?' cried Mr. Riderhood, half beside himself between the two. Then, propitiatingly and crawlingly, "'You, sir, you ain't said what you want of me. Is it fair, is it worthy of yourself, to talk of my defying you afore ever you say what you want of me?' "'I don't want much,' said the man. 
and this accusation of yours must not be left half made and half unmade. What was done for the blood money must be thoroughly undone. Well, but shipmate— Don't call me shipmate, said the man. Captain, then, urged Mr. Riderhood. There, you won't object to Captain. It's an honourable title, and you fully look it. Captain, ain't the man dead? Now I ask you fair, ain't Gaffer dead? Well, returned the other with impatience, yes, he is dead. What then? Can words hurt a dead man, Captain? I only ask you fair. They can hurt the memory of a dead man, and they can hurt his living children. How many children had this man? Meaning Gaffer, Captain? Of whom else are we speaking? returned the other with a movement of his foot, as if Rogue Riderhood were beginning to sneak before him in the body as well as the spirit, and he spurned him off. I have heard of a daughter and a son. I ask for information. I ask your daughter. I prefer to speak to her. What children did Hexham leave? Pleasant, looking to her father for permission to reply, that honest man exclaimed with great bitterness, "'Why the devil don't you answer the captain? You can poll parrot enough when you ain't wanted to poll parrot, you perverse jade!' Thus encouraged, Pleasant explained that there were only Lizzie, the daughter in question, and the youth. Both very respectable, she added. "'It is dreadful.' "'that any stigma should attach to them,' said the visitor, "'whom the consideration rendered so uneasy "'that he rose and paced to and fro, muttering, "'Dreadful! Unforeseen! How could it be foreseen?' "'Then he stopped and asked aloud, "'Where do they live?' "'Pleasant further explained that only the daughter "'had resided with the father at the time of his accidental death, "'and that she had immediately afterwards quitted the neighbourhood. "'I know that.' said the man, for I have been to the place they dwelt in at the time of the inquest. Could you quietly find out for me where she lives now? Pleasant had no doubt she could do that. Within what time, did she think? Within a day. The visitor said that was well, and he would return for the information, relying on its being obtained. To this dialogue Riderhood had attended in silence, and he now obsequiously bespake the captain. Captain! "'Mentioning them unfortunate words of mine respecting Gaffer, "'it is contrarily to be bore in mind that Gaffer always were a precious rascal, "'and that his line were a thieving line. "'Likewise, when I went to them two governors, "'Lawyer Lightwood and the t'other governor, with my information, "'I may have been little over-eager for the cause of justice, "'or, to put it another way, a little overstimulated by them feelings which rouses a man up when a pot of money is going about to get his hand into that pot of money for his family's sake. Besides which, I think the wine of them two governors was, I will not say a hocust wine, but fur from a wine as was healthy for the mind. And there's another thing to be remembered, Captain. Did I stick to them words when Gaffer was no more? Did I say bold to them two governors? Governors both. What I informed, I still inform. What was took down, I hold to. No. I says frank and open. No shuffling, mind you, Captain. I may have been mistook. I've been thinking of it. It mayn't have been took down correct on this and that, and I won't swear to thick and thin. I'd rather forfeit your good opinions than do it. "'And so far as I know,' concluded Mr. Riderhood, by way of proof and evidence to character, "'I have, actually, forfeited the good opinions of several persons, even your own, Captain, if I understand your words, but I'd sooner do it than be forswore. There, if that's conspiracy, call me conspirator.' "'You shall sign,' said the visitor, taking very little heed of this oration, "'A statement that it was all utterly false, and the poor girl shall have it. "'I'll bring it with me for your signature when I come again.' "'When might you be expected, Captain?' inquired Riderhood again, dubiously getting between him and the door. "'Quite soon enough for you. I shall not disappoint you. Don't be afraid.' "'Might you be inclined to leave any name, Captain?' "'No, not at all.' 
I have no such intention. "'Shall is summit of a hard word, Captain,' urged Riderhood, still feebly dodging between him and the door as he advanced. "'When you say a man shall sign this and that and t'other, Captain, you order him about in a grand sort of a way. Don't it seem so to yourself?' The man stood still, and angrily fixed him with his eyes. "'Father! Father!' entreated Pleasant from the door, with her disengaged hand nervously trembling at her lips. "'Don't! Don't get into trouble any more!' "'Hear me out, Captain! Hear me out! All I was wishing to mention, Captain, afore you took your departure,' said the sneaking Mr. Riderhood, falling out of his path, "'was your handsome words relating to the reward.' "'When I claim it,' said the man, in a tone which seemed to leave some such words as you dog very distinctly understood, "'you shall share it.' Looking steadfastly at Riderhood, he once more said in a low voice, this time with a grim sort of admiration of him as a perfect piece of evil, "'What a liar you are!' And, nodding his head twice or thrice over the compliment, passed out of the shop. But to Pleasant he said good-night kindly. The honest man who gained his living by the sweat of his brow remained in a state akin to stupefaction, until the footless glass and the unfinished bottle conveyed themselves into his mind. From his mind he conveyed them into his hands, and so conveyed the last of the wine into his stomach. When that was done, he awoke to a clear perception that Paul Parroting was solely chargeable with what had passed. Therefore, not to be remiss in his duty as a father, he threw a pair of sea-boots at Pleasant, which she ducked to avoid, and then cried, poor thing, using her hair for a pocket-handkerchief. End of Book Two, Chapter Twelve Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Thirteen, A Solo and a Duet the wind was blowing so hard when the visitor came out at the shop-door into the darkness and dirt of Limehouse Hole, that it almost blew him in again. Doors were slamming violently, lamps were flickering or blown out, signs were rocking in their frames, the water of the kennels, wind dispersed, flew about in drops like rain. Indifferent to the weather, and even preferring it to better weather for its clearance of the streets, the man looked about him with a scrutinising glance. "'Thus much I know,' he murmured. "'I had never been here since that night, "'and never was here before that night, "'but thus much I recognise. "'I wonder which way did we take "'when we came out of that shop. "'We turned to the right, as I have turned, "'but I can recall no more. "'Did we go by this alley, "'or down that little lane?' "'He tried both, "'but both confused him equally, "'and he came straying back to the same spot.' I remember there were poles pushed out of upper windows on which clothes were drying, and I remember a low public house, and the sound flowing down a narrow passage belonging to it, of the scraping of a fiddle, and the shuffling of feet. But here are all these things in the lane, and here are all these things in the alley, and I have nothing else in my mind but a wall, a dark doorway, a flight of stairs, and a room. He tried a new direction, but made nothing of it. Walls, dark doorways, flights of stairs and rooms were too abundant, and, like most people so puzzled, he again and again described a circle, and found himself at the point from which he had begun. "'This is like what I have read in narratives of escape from prison,' said he, "'where the little track of the fugitives in the night always seems to take the shape of the great round world on which they wander, as if it were a secret law. Here he ceased to be the oakum-headed, oakum-whiskered man, on whom Miss Pleasant Riderhood had looked, and allowing for his being still wrapped in a nautical overcoat, became as like that same lost, wanted Mr. Julius Handford, as never man was like another in this world. In the breast of the coat he stowed the bristling hair and whisker, 
In a moment, as the favouring wind went with him down a solitary place that it had swept clear of passengers, yet in that same moment he was the secretary also, Mr. Boffin's secretary. For John Rokesmith, too, was as like that same lost, wanted Mr. Julius Hanford as never man was like another in this world. "'I have no clue to the scene of my death,' said he. "'Not that it matters now. But having risked discovery by venturing here at all, I should have been glad to track some part of the way.' With which singular words he abandoned his search, came up out of Limehouse Hole, and took the way past Limehouse Church. At the great iron gate of the churchyard he stopped and looked in. He looked up at the high tower, spectrally resisting the wind, and he looked round at the white tombstones, like enough to their dead in their winding sheets, and he counted the nine tolls of the clock-bell. "'It is a sensation not experienced by many mortals,' said he, "'to be looking into a churchyard on a wild, windy night, and to feel that I no more hold a place among the living than these dead do.' and even to know that I lie buried somewhere else, as they lie buried here. Nothing uses me to it. A spirit that was once a man could hardly feel stranger or lonelier going unrecognised among mankind than I feel. But this is the fanciful side of the situation. It has a real side, so difficult that, though I think of it every day, I never thoroughly think it out. Now, let me determine to think it out as I walk home. I know I evade it, as many men, perhaps most men, do evade thinking their way through their greatest perplexity. I will try to pin myself to mine. Don't evade it, John Harmon. Don't evade it. Think it out. When I came to England, attracted to the country with which I had none but most miserable associations, by the accounts of my fine inheritance that found me abroad, I came back, shrinking from my father's money, shrinking from my father's memory, mistrustful of being forced on a mercenary wife, mistrustful of my father's intention in thrusting that marriage on me, mistrustful that I was already growing avaricious, mistrustful that I was slackening in gratitude to the two dear noble honest friends who had made the only sunlight in my childish life, or that of my heart-broken sister. I came back, timid, divided in my mind, afraid of myself and everybody here, knowing of nothing but wretchedness that my father's wealth had ever brought about. Now stop, and so far think it out, John Harmon. Is that so? That is exactly so. On board, serving as third mate, was George Radfoot. I knew nothing of him. His name first became known to me about a week before we sailed, through my being accosted by one of the ship-agent's clerks as Mr. Radfoot. It was one day when I had gone aboard to look to my preparations, and the clerk, coming behind me as I stood on deck, tapped me on the shoulder and said, "'Mr. Radfoot, look here,' referring to some papers that he had in his hand, and my name first became known to Radfoot, through another clerk, within a day or two, and while the ship was yet in port, coming up behind him, tapping him on the shoulder, and beginning, I beg your pardon, Mr. Harmon. I believe we were alike in bulk and stature, but not otherwise, and that we were not strikingly alike, even in those respects, when we were together, and could be compared. However, a sociable word or two on these mistakes became an easy introduction between us, and the weather was hot, and he helped me to a cool cavern on deck alongside his own, and his first school had been at Brussels, as mine had been, and he had learned French, as I had learnt it, and he had a little history of himself to relate. God only knows how much of it was true, and how much of it false, that had its likeness to mine. I had been a seaman, too, so we got to be confidential together, and the more easily yet, because he and every one on board had known by general rumour what I was making the voyage to England for. By such degrees and means he came to the knowledge of my uneasiness of mind, and of its setting at that time in the direction of desiring to see and form some judgment of my allotted wife, before she could possibly know me for myself, also to try Mrs. Boffin and give her a glad surprise. 
So the plot was made out of our getting common sailors' dresses, as he was able to guide me about London, and throwing ourselves in Bella Wilfer's neighbourhood, and trying to put ourselves in her way, and doing whatever chance might favour on the spot, and seeing what came of it. If nothing came of it, I should be no worse off, and there would merely be a short delay in my presenting myself to Lightwood. I have all these facts right? Yes, they are all accurately right. His advantage in all this was, that for a time I was to be lost. It might be for a day, or for two days, but I must be lost sight of on landing, or there would be recognition, anticipation, and failure. Therefore I disembarked, with my valise in my hand, as Potterson, the steward, and Mr. Jacob Kibble, my fellow-passenger, afterwards remembered, and waited for him in the dark, by that very Limehouse church, which is now behind me. As I had always shunned the port of London, I only knew the church through his pointing out its spire from on board. Perhaps I might recall, if it were any good to try, the way by which I went to it alone from the river, but how we two went from it to Riderhood's shop. I don't know, any more than I know what turns we took and doubles we made after we left it. The way was purposely confused, no doubt. But let me go on thinking the facts out, and avoid confusing them with my speculations. Whether he took me by a straight way or a crooked way, what is that to the purpose now? Steady, John Harmon. When we stopped at Riderhood's, and he asked that scoundrel a question or two, purporting to refer only to the lodging-houses in which there was accommodation for us, had I the least suspicion of him? None. Certainly none until afterwards, when I held the clue. I think he must have got from Riderhood in a paper the drug, or whatever it was, that afterwards stupefied me, but I am far from sure. All I felt safe in charging on him to-night was old companionship and villainy between them. Their undisguised intimacy, and the character I now know Riderhood to bear, made that not at all adventurous. But I am not clear about the drug. Thinking out the circumstances in which I found my suspicion, there are only two. 1. I remember his changing a small folded paper from one pocket to another, after we came out, which he had not touched before. 2. I now know Riderhood to have been previously taken up for being concerned in the robbery of an unlucky seaman to whom some such poison had been given. It is my conviction that we cannot have gone a mile from that shop, before we came to the wall, the dark doorway, the flight of stairs, and the room. The night was particularly dark, and it rained hard. As I think the circumstances back, I hear the rain splashing on the stone pavement of the passage, which was not under cover. The room overlooked the river, or a dock or a creek, and the tide was out. Being possessed of the time down to that point, I know by the hour that it must have been about low water, but while the coffee was getting ready, I drew back the curtain, a dark brown curtain, and, looking out, knew by the kind of reflection below, of the few neighbouring lights, that they were reflected in tidal mud. He had carried under his arm a canvas bag, containing a suit of his clothes. I had no change of outer clothes with me, as I was to buy slops. "'You are very wet, Mr. Harmon,' I can hear him saying, "'and I am quite dry under this good waterproof coat. "'Put on these clothes of mine. "'You may find on trying them that they will answer your purpose to-morrow "'as well as the slops you mean to buy, or better. "'While you change, I'll hurry the hot coffee.' "'When he came back, I had his clothes on, "'and there was a black man with him, wearing a linen jacket, like a steward, who put the smoking coffee on the table in a tray, and never looked at me. I am so far literal and exact. Literal and exact, I am certain. Now, I pass to sick and deranged impressions. They are so strong that I rely upon them. But there are spaces between them that I know nothing about, and they are not pervaded by any idea of time. I had drank some coffee— when, to my sense of sight, he began to swell immensely, and something urged me to rush at him. 
we had a struggle near the door. He got from me, through my not knowing where to strike, in the whirling round of the room, and the flashing of flames of fire between us. I dropped down, lying helpless on the ground. I was turned over by a foot. I was dragged by the neck into a corner. I heard men speak together. I was turned over by other feet. I saw a figure like myself, lying dressed in my clothes on a bed. What might have been, for anything I knew, a silence of days, weeks, months, years, was broken by a violent wrestling of men all over the room. The figure like myself was assailed, and my valise was in its hand. I was trodden upon, and fallen over. I heard a noise of blows, and thought it was a woodcutter cutting down a tree. I could not have said that my name was John Harmon. I could not have thought it. I didn't know it. But when I heard the blows, I thought of the woodcutter and his axe, and had some dead idea that I was lying in a forest. This is still correct? Still correct, with the exception that I cannot possibly express it to myself without using the word I. But it was not I. There was no such thing as I within my knowledge. It was only after a downward slide through something like a tube, and then a great noise and a sparkling and crackling as of fires, that the consciousness came upon me. This is John Harmon drowning. John Harmon, struggle for your life. John Harmon, call on heaven and save yourself. I think I cried it out aloud in a great agony. And then a heavy, horrid, unintelligible something vanished, and it was I who was struggling there, alone in the water. I was very weak and faint, frightfully oppressed with drowsiness, and driving fast with the tide. Looking over the black water, I saw the lights racing past me on the two banks of the river, as if they were eager to be gone and leave me dying in the dark. The tide was running down, but I knew nothing of up or down then. When, guiding myself safely with heaven's assistance before the fierce set of the water, I at last caught at a boat moored, one of a tier of boats at a causeway, I was sucked under her, and came up, only just alive, on the other side. Was I long in the water? Long enough to be chilled to the heart, but I don't know how long. Yet the cold was merciful, for it was the cold night air and the rain that restored me from a swoon on the stones of the causeway. They naturally supposed me to have toppled in drunk when I crept to the public house it belonged to, for I had no notion where I was, and could not articulate, through the poison that had made me insensible having affected my speech, and I supposed the night to be the previous night, as it was still dark and raining, but I had lost twenty-four hours. I have checked the calculation often, and it must have been two nights that I lay recovering in that public house. Let me see. Yes, I am sure it was while I lay in that bed there that the thought entered my head of turning the danger I had passed through to the account of being for some time supposed to have disappeared mysteriously, and of proving Bella. The dread of our being forced on one another— and perpetuating the fate that seemed to have fallen on my father's riches, the fate that they should lead to nothing but evil, was strong upon the moral timidity that dates from my childhood with my poor sister. As to this hour, I cannot understand that side of the river where I recovered the shore, being the opposite side to that on which I was ensnared. I shall never understand it now. Even at this moment, while I leave the river behind me going home, I cannot conceive that it rolls between me and that spot, or that the sea is where it is. But this is not thinking it out, this is making a leap to the present time. I could not have done it but for the fortune in the waterproof belt round my body. Not a great fortune, forty and odd pounds for the inheritor of a hundred and odd thousand, but it was enough. Without it I must have disclosed myself. Without it I could never have gone to that exchequer coffee-house, or taken Mrs. Wilfer's lodgings. Some twelve days I lived at that hotel, before the night when I saw the corpse of Radfoot at the police-station. 
the inexpressible mental horror that I laboured under, as one of the consequences of the poison, makes the interval seem greatly longer, but I know it cannot have been longer. That suffering has gradually weakened and weakened since, and has only come upon me by starts, and I hope I am free from it now. But even now I have sometimes to think, constrain myself, and stop before speaking, or I could not say the words I want to say. Again I ramble away from thinking it out to the end. It is not so far to the end that I need be tempted to break off. Now, on straight. I examined the newspapers every day for tidings that I was missing, but saw none. Going out that night to walk, for I kept retired while it was light, I found a crowd assembled round a placard posted at Whitehall. It described myself, John Harmon, was found dead and mutilated in the river, under circumstances of strong suspicion, described my dress, described the papers in my pockets, and stated where I was lying for recognition. In a wild and cautious way I hurried there, and there, with the horror of the death I had escaped before my eyes in its most appalling shape, added to the inconceivable horror tormenting me at that time, when the poisonous stuff was strongest on me, I perceived that Radfoot had been murdered by some unknown hands for the money for which he would have murdered me, and that probably we had both been shot into the river from the same dark place into the same dark tide, when the stream ran deep and strong. That night I almost gave up my mystery, though I suspected no one, could offer no information, knew absolutely nothing save that the murdered man was not I, but Radfoot. Next day, while I hesitated, and next day, while I hesitated, it seemed as if the whole country were determined to have me dead. The inquest declared me dead. The government proclaimed me dead. I could not listen at my fireside for five minutes to the outer noises, but it was borne into my ears that I was dead. So John Harmon died, and Julius Hanford disappeared, and John Rokesmith was born. John Rokesmith's intent to-night has been to repair a wrong that he could never have imagined possible, coming to his ears through the lightwood talk related to him, and which he is bound by every consideration to remedy. In that intent, John Rokesmith will persevere, as his duty is. Now, is it all thought out? All to this time? Nothing omitted? No. Nothing. But beyond this time, to think it out through the future, is a harder though a much shorter task than to think it out through the past. John Harmon is dead. Should John Harmon come to life? If yes, why? If no, why? Take yes first. To enlighten human justice concerning the offence of one far beyond it who may have a living mother, to enlighten it with the lights of a stone passage, a flight of stairs, a brown window curtain, and a black man, to come into possession of my father's money, and with it, sordidly, to buy a beautiful creature whom I love. I cannot help it. Reason has nothing to do with it. I love her against reason. But who would as soon love me for my own sake, as she would love the beggar at the corner? What a use for the money! and are worthy of its old misuses. Now, take no. The reasons why John Harmon should not come to life. Because he has passively allowed these dear old faithful friends to pass into possession of the property. Because he sees them happy with it, making a good use of it, effacing the old rust and tarnish on the money. Because they have virtually adopted Bella, and will provide for her because there is affection enough in her nature, and warmth enough in her heart, to develop into something enduringly good, under favourable conditions, because her faults have been intensified by her place in my father's will, and she is already growing better, because her marriage with John Harmon, after what I have heard from her own lips, would be a shocking mockery, of which both she and I must always be conscious, and which would degrade her in her mind, and me in mine, and each of us and the others. 
because if John Harmon comes to life and does not marry her, the property falls into the very hands that hold it now. What would I have? Dead, I have found the true friends of my lifetime still as true, as tender, and as faithful as when I was alive, and making my memory an incentive to good actions done in my name. Dead, I have found them when they might have slighted my name, and passed greedily over my grave to ease and wealth, lingering by the way like single-hearted children to recall their love for me when I was a poor frightened child. Dead, I have heard from the woman who would have been my wife if I had lived, the revolting truth that I should have purchased her, caring nothing for me as a sultan buys a slave. What would I have? If the dead could know, or do know, how the living use them, who among the hosts of dead has found a more disinterested fidelity on earth than I, is not that enough for me? If I had come back, these noble creatures would have welcomed me, wept over me, given up everything to me with joy. I did not come back, and they have passed unspoiled into my place. Let them rest in it, and let Bella rest in hers. What course for me, then? This, to live the same quiet, secretary life, carefully avoiding chances of recognition, until they shall have become more accustomed to their altered state, and until the great swarm of swindlers, under many names, shall have found newer prey. By that time, the method I am establishing through all the affairs, and with which I will every day take new pains to make them both familiar, will be— I may hope, a machine in such working order as that they can keep it going. I know I need but ask of their generosity to have. When the right time comes, I will ask no more than will replace me in my former path of life, and John Rokesmith shall tread it as contentedly as he may, but John Harmon shall come back no more. That I may never, in the days to come afar off, have any weak misgiving that Bella might, in any contingency, have taken me for my own sake, if I had plainly asked her, I will plainly ask her, proving beyond all question what I already know too well. And now it is all thought out, from the beginning to the end, and my mind is easier. So deeply engaged had the living dead man been, in thus communing with himself, that he had regarded neither the wind nor the way, and had resisted the former instinctively, as he had pursued the latter. But being now come into the city, where there was a coach-stand, he stood irresolute whether to go to his lodgings, or to go first to Mr. Boffin's house. He decided to go round by the house, arguing, as he carried his overcoat upon his arm, that it was less likely to attract notice, if left there, than if taken to Holloway, both Mrs. Wilfer and Miss Lavinia being ravenously curious, touching every article of which the lodger stood possessed. Arriving at the house, he found that Mr. and Mrs. Boffin were out, but that Miss Wilfer was in the drawing-room. Miss Wilfer had remained at home, in consequence of not feeling very well, and had inquired in the evening if Mr. Rokesmith were in his room. "'Make my compliments to Miss Wilfer, and say I am here now.' Miss Wilfer's compliments came down in return, and, if it were not too much trouble, would Mr. Rokesmith be so kind as to come up before he went. It was not too much trouble, and Mr. Rokesmith came up. Oh, she looked very pretty. She looked very, very pretty. If the father of the late John Harmon had but left his money unconditionally to his son, and if his son had but lighted on this lovable girl for himself— and had the happiness to make her loving, as well as lovable. "'Dear me! Are you not well, Mr. Rokesmith?' "'Yes, uh, quite well. I was sorry to hear when I came in that you were not.' "'A mere nothing. I had a headache. Gone now. And was not quite fit for a hot theatre, so I stayed at home. I asked you if you were not well, because you look so white.' "'Do I? I have had a busy evening.' She was on a low ottoman before the fire, with a little shining jewel of a table, and her book and her work beside her. Ah, what a different life the late John Harmon's, 
if it had been his happy privilege to take his place upon that ottoman, and draw his arm about that waist, and say, I hope the time has been long without me. What a home goddess you look, my darling! But the present John Rokesmith, far removed from the late John Harmon, remained standing at a distance. A little distance in respect of space, but a great distance in respect of separation. "'Mr. Rokesmith,' said Bella, taking up her work and inspecting it all round the corners, "'I wanted to say something to you, when I could have the opportunity, as an explanation why I was so rude to you the other day. You have no right to think ill of me, sir.' The sharp little way in which she darted a look at him, half sensitively injured and half pettishly, would have been very much admired by the late John Harmon. "'You don't know how well I think of you, Miss Wilfer.' "'Truly. You must have a very high opinion of me, Mr. Rokesmith, when you believe that in prosperity I neglect and forget my old home.' "'Do I believe so?' "'You did, sir, at any rate,' returned Bella. "'I took the liberty of reminding you of a little omission into which you had fallen, insensibly and naturally fallen. It was no more than that.' "'And I beg leave to ask you, Mr. Rokesmith,' said Bella, "'Why you took that liberty? I hope there is no offence in the phrase. It is your own, remember?' "'Because I am truly, deeply, profoundly interested in you, Miss Wilfer, because I wish to see you always at your best. Because I—shall I go on?' "'No, sir,' returned Bella, with a burning face. "'You have said more than enough. I beg that you will not go on. If you have any generosity, any honour, you will say no more." The late John Harmon, looking at the proud face with the downcast eyes, and at the quick breathing as it stirred the fall of bright brown hair over the beautiful neck, would probably have remained silent. "'I wish to speak to you, sir,' said Bella, "'once for all, and I don't know how to do it. I have sat here all this evening, wishing to speak to you, and it determining to speak to you, and feeling that I must, I, I beg for a moment's time." He remained silent, and she remained with her face averted, sometimes making a slight movement as if she would turn and speak. At length she did so. "'You know how I am situated here, sir, and you know how I am situated at home. I must speak to you for myself since there is no one about me whom I could ask to do so. It is not generous in you, it is not honourable in you, to conduct yourself towards me as you do." "'Is it ungenerous or dishonourable to be devoted to you, fascinated by you?' "'Preposterous!' said Bella. The late John Harmon might have thought it rather a contemptuous and lofty word of repudiation. I. Now feel obliged to go on," pursued the secretary. Though it were only in self-explanation and self-defence, I hope, Miss Wilfer, that it is not unpardonable, even in me, to make an honest declaration of an honest devotion to you." "'An honest declaration?' repeated Bella, with emphasis. "'Is it otherwise?' "'I must request, sir said Bella, taking refuge in a touch of timely resentment, that I may not be questioned. You must excuse me if I decline to be cross-examined." "'Oh, Miss Wilfer, this is hardly charitable. I ask you nothing but what your own emphasis suggests. However, I waive even that question. But what I have declared, I take my stand by. I cannot recall the avowal of my earnest and deep attachment to you, and I do not recall it." "'I reject it, sir,' said Bella. "'I should be blind and deaf if I were not prepared for the reply. Forgive my offence, for it carries its punishment with it." "'What punishment?' asked Bella. "'Is my present endurance none? But excuse me, I did not mean to cross-examine you again. "'You take advantage of a hasty word of mine,' said Bella, with a little sting of self-reproach, "'to make me seem—I don't know what. I spoke without consideration when I used it. 
If that was bad, I am sorry, but you repeat it after consideration, and that seems to me to be at least no better. For the rest, I beg it may be understood, Mr. Rokesmith, that there is an end of this between us, now and for ever. Now and for ever, he repeated. Yes, I appeal to you, sir, proceeded Bella, with increasing spirit, not to pursue me. I appeal to you not to take advantage of your position in this house, to make my position in distressing and disagreeable. I appeal to you to discontinue your habit of making your misplaced attentions as plain to Mrs. Boffin as to me. Have I done so? I should think you have, replied Bella. In any case, it is not your fault if you have not, Mr. Rokesmith. I hope you are wrong in that impression. I should be very sorry to have justified it. I think I have not. For the future there is no apprehension. It is all over. I am much relieved to hear it, said Bella. I have far other views in life, and, and why should you waste your own? Mine, said the secretary. My life. His curious tone caused Bella to glance at the curious smile with which he said it. It was gone as he glanced back. "'Pardon me, Miss Wilfer,' he proceeded, when their eyes met. "'You have used some hard words, for which I do not doubt you have a justification in your mind, that I do not understand. Ungenerous and dishonourable. In what?' "'I would rather not be asked,' said Bella, haughtily looking down. "'I would rather not ask. But the question is imposed upon me. Kindly explain. Or, if not kindly, justly.' "'Oh, sir,' said Bella, raising her eyes to his, after a little struggle to forbear, "'is it generous and honourable to use the power here which your favour with Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, and your ability in your place, give you against me?' "'Against you?' "'Is it generous and honourable to form a plan for gradually bringing their influence to bear upon a suit which I have shown you that I do not like?' and which I tell you that I utterly reject. The late John Harmon could have borne a good deal, but he would have been cut to the heart by such a suspicion as this. Would it be generous and honourable to step into your place, if you did so, for I don't know that you did, and I hope you did not, anticipating, or knowing beforehand, that I should come here, and designing to take me at this disadvantage? "'This mean and cruel disadvantage?' said the secretary. "'Yes,' assented Bella. The secretary kept silence for a little while, then merely said, "'You are wholly mistaken, Miss Wilfer, wonderfully mistaken. I cannot say, however, that it is your fault. If I deserve better things of you, you do not know it.' "'At least, sir,' retorted Bella, with her old indignation rising, you know the history of my being here at all. I have heard Mr. Boffin say that you are master of every line and word of that will, as you are master of all his affairs. And was it not enough that I should have been willed away, like a horse, or a dog, or a bird, but must you too begin to dispose of me in your mind, and speculate in me, as soon as I had ceased to be the talk and the laugh of the town? Am I for ever to be made the property of strangers?' "'Believe me,' returned the secretary, "'you are wonderfully mistaken.' "'I should be glad to know it,' answered Bella. "'I doubt if you ever will. "'Good night. "'Of course I shall be careful to conceal any traces of this interview from Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, "'as long as I remain here. "'Trust me, what you have complained of is at an end for ever.' "'I am glad I have spoken, then, Mr. Rokesmith. "'It has been painful and difficult, but it is done. "'If I have hurt you, I hope you will forgive me. "'I am inexperienced and impetuous, and I have been a little spoilt. "'But I, really I am not so bad as I dare say I appear, or as you think me.' "'He quitted the room when Bella had said this, "'relenting in her wilful, inconsistent way.' Left alone, she threw herself back on her ottoman, and said, "'I didn't know the lovely woman was such a dragon.' Then she got up, and looked in the glass, and said to her image, 
"'You have been positively swelling your features, you little fool!' Then she took an impatient walk to the other end of the room, and back, and said, "'I wish Pa was here to have a talk about an avaricious marriage. But he is better away, poor dear, for I know I should pull his hair if he was here.' And then she threw her work away, and threw her book after it, and sat down, and hummed a tune, and hummed it out of tune, and quarrelled with it. And John Rokesmith, what did he? He went down to his room, and buried John Harmon many additional fathoms deep. He took his hat, and walked out, and as he went to Holloway, or anywhere else, not at all minding where, heaped mounds upon mounds of earth over John Harmon's grave. His walking did not bring him home until the dawn of day. And so busy had he been all night, piling and piling weights upon weights of earth above John Harmon's grave, that by that time John Harmon lay buried under a whole alpine range, and still the sexton rokesmith accumulated mountains over him, lightening his labour with the dirge, "'Cover him, crush him, keep him down!' End of Book Two Chapter Thirteen